Will the meeting please come to order? Adequate notice of this meeting as required by the Open Public Meetings Act of 1975 has been provided by a notice published in the Home News Tribune on December 28, 2018 and posted in the main lobby of the municipal complex on January 5, 2019. At this time, I would ask you rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Hey, Lillian. Chair Lillian Yes, present. Vice Chair Pippola. Here. Mr. Corrette. Here. Council Member Sandelsky. Here. Mr. Soltes. Here. Mr. Peasy. Here. Mr. Khan is not present. Mr. Singh. Yes. Mr. Danielle. Here. Mr. Reeder is not present. Mr. Zing. Yes. Attorney Rubin. Mr. Bignell. Here. I forgot how to say it. What's your last name? Santisel. Mr. Santisel. Yes. Okay. Okay. Acceptance of minutes. There are none. On to resolutions. Has everyone had an opportunity to review the resolutions? Resolutions? Oh, 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 that's why they're looking at me. <laughs> okay. P7-2019, William Grant and Son, 130 Fieldcrest Avenue. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve P7-2019. Madam Chair, I'd like to second that. Okay, Lillian? Ms. Ruggieri? Yes. Mr. Corrette? Yes. Mr. Peasy? Yes. Mr. Pippola? Yes. Mr. Reeder is not present. Chair Councilman Sandelsky? Yes. Mr. Soltes? Yes. This resolution is approved. Okay, the next one, P3-2019. Factory Direct Enterprises, 3025 Woodbridge Avenue. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve P3 dash 2019 um, before the board approved this uh, there was an error on the plans uh, the zoning table showed that there would be 130 parking spaces but the actual count I'm told is 127 only 122 are necessary under the zoning ordinance so they would still have excessive parking spaces the resolution as written says 130 because that's what the plan that's what was in the zoning table but I'm asking the board to as part of this motion amended to say 127 spaces will be provided on site and I can I can then modify that resolution send it to Lillian and have her sign it and it can be for, formalized that way madam chair I'd like to make a, a motion to for the amendment to uh, bring it Wait to 127 a, any question over I had here? a question for yeah, uh, mr. Danielle so so how did that happen it apparently someone miscounted Yes, on the applicant side. So the zoning table says there's 130, but apparently when you actually count the number of spaces that will be on site once the improvements are construction, it's 127. Madam Chair, maybe I help you a little bit. Yep. Mr. Um, I've been out there many times. They don't use all their parking, so I don't. I don't. I think it's de minimis. So I don't think there should be a problem with the no, I, with the reduction I, I in three. Have, I don't have a concern with it. I just want to know how it happened. Why did it happen? Oh, I guess just a, a drafting mistake on the. Uh, on the plan itself, and we picked up off the off the chart the number, but then when you count the spaces, it was 127. Okay. All right. Mr. Pippola, did you have something? Or? No, I didn't. Okay. Oh, okay. So okay. I, I'm a motion. I made a motion to uh, approve the uh, amendment to 127. Okay. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, Lillian. Mr. Corrett. Yes. Mr. Danielle? Yes. Mr. Peasy? Yes. Mr. Pippola? Yes. 
Mr. Reeder is not present. Chairwoman Ruggieri? Yes on the motion. Councilman Sandelsky? Yes on the motion with the modification. Mr. Soltes? Yes. This resolution is approved. Okay, the next one, P4-2019, General Electric International, 199-219 Lafayette Avenue. Chairwoman, this is the uh, Menlo Park Mall, the parking, uh, the electrified solar panels above the spaces. Is that what this is? Yes. I believe yes. Yes, yes that's what this okay. is. All right. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve P4-2019. Madam Chair, I'd like to second that motion. Okay, Lillian? Mr. Corret? Yes. Mr. Danielle? Yes. Mr. Peasy? Yes. Mr. Pippola? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Reeder, he's not present. Chairwoman Ruggieri? Yes. Council Member Sandelsky? Yes. Mr. Soltes? Yes. This resolution is approved. Okay, and I believe the last one on our list of resolutions, it's Woodbridge Avenue Redevelopment Plan. Madam Chair, I'd like to make, uh, make a motion to approve and forward to Council the redevelopment plan for Woodbridge Avenue. Okay, do I have a second? Madam Chair, I'd like to second that motion. Okay, Lillian? Mr. Corret? Yes, in the motion. Mr. Danielle? Yes. Mr. Kahn is not present. Mr. Peasy? Yes. Mr. Pippola? Yes. Mr. Reeder is not present. Chairwoman Ruggieri? Yes. Council Member Sandelsky? Abstain to vote at Council. Mr. Soltes? Yes. This is approved to go back to Council. Okay, now we are going to skip on our agenda to page two. We have under miscellaneous a concept presentation from the Edison Board of Education for six school additions and renovations. Good evening, I'm Jean Parentoni. I'm a licensed architect in New Jersey, and I'm representing the Edison Township Board of Education this evening. I know you have a full agenda, so I will try to give you a succinct summary of what is being proposed. It is for capital improvements. I previously was here in May talking about a project that the board is funding directly out of the budget, and that was the addition to Wilson Middle School. That's work that'll be completed this summer. The six projects that I'll mention this evening are are projects that are being proposed for a public referendum. The funding would come through a public referendum. The board is considering dates in 2019. There's three dates that are available for them to consider. They're also considering to do all six projects, although that is still something that will be finalized when they do the final um, approvals from the Board of Education. So this is proposed. It is down at the Department of Education for review as we speak and we welcome any comments or questions that you have with the scope. The primary purpose of the referendum is to address past capacity needs since the district has absorbed over 1,900 students over the past six years with only minimal changes to their facilities. They also have a projection of over 500 students over the next five years that are so the uh, township is still growing with the number of students. So the, for the most part, the referendum uh, is really geared towards additions for classroom capacity, science labs, and specialized instructional spaces, including um, multi-purpose room gymnasiums at some of the schools. The school, the top school in the needs, and the reason why these six were chosen is that for the most part, all these schools are, have existing trailers at the buildings already. So one of the goal is to take off these detached single unit trailers and have the classes go into buildings and into the really connected component. So safety, security, and access is part of the mission of the, uh, the, the project. What I did in the summary sheet is to try to outline, I know the information that you've looked in for in the past, which just talks about square footprint that's additions being added, as well as how it compares to the existing building. I have you know, how many stories in height it is. It varies from one story additions at the elementary schools to up to a three story addition at uh, J.P. Stevens. 
shows you the net gain on a per uh, school basis as well as the costs associated with the, the project, um, both in breaking it down for construction costs, costs for fixed uh, components with construction, as well as the total project number that includes the soft costs. In terms of the timeline, the, the project would be take approximately three years from once the funding is in place, so that will be post the referendum approved, uh, approved by the voters. And, um, and we'd be looking to address that capacity on an incremental phase manner at the school so that parts of it would come online sooner than others, but it would probably take a good three years to finish everything in the scope that's being proposed. Just to do a few highlights on the diagrams I've given you, I've given you two things. One is a site plan that has the colors of purple and some yellow in it. The purple is the new net new construction being added. So if you go to that, you can see that the, where the new additions are being proposed. Then there's also floor plans. I know you're less interested in the floor plans, but in case you were curious about what that purple represented, we also have floor plans to show you the magnitude of the, um, the number of classrooms being added at each of the schools. I don't know whether you want me to go specifically school by school or how best to handle it, um, or you have general questions on the overall scope or needs, or um, I, I serve you. <laughs> yeah. So, Mr. Danielle. What's the total bond issue projected to be? When you add up all those project cost estimates, it's 189500000 as a total project budget. That includes everything from the hard cost, it includes the fixed cost for furniture, fin uh, fixed uh, equipment. It includes contingency. The Department of Education requires a 10% construction contingency being added on because this is such a preliminary plan. There's no hard drawings done, so you have to add for, for changes. And then you have the soft cost, which includes all your testing, environmental components, civil engineering, surveys, and all the other components. <coughs> And that's the 189500 And as I mentioned, the Board of Education at this point has not issued the, um, the resolution for issuing it for a public referendum. That's still in coming up. But what they want to do is have the review by the state, get comments from them, as well as any comments you want to share with them. Mr. Pippola? Yes. Uh, this additional capacity, do you, do you have a number? I mean, is, how many classrooms or how many yes. kids? Or what it's, is, what, what, it, the full implementation of this would do what? Yeah, first? and you're going to see it, it really starts with um, J.P. Stevens. We're adding practically 40 instructional spaces. At uh, Edison High School, we're adding 20 instructional spaces. So when you really add it all up on the six pages, it's about 200 instructional spaces being added district-wide. That capacity is around 2,000 seats. And I mentioned earlier that they've already absorbed 1,889 students over the past six years, and they have another 537 students that are essentially in the system that are coming up and moving up in the thing. So they really have a, a, a net need of over 2,300. They have um, some capacity they've already absorbed, but that's really the, the impetus is really to address that past capacity, because what's happened is that you've had trailers added on, you have class size that are exceeding, and you've had programs that have had to go onto carts, for example, uh, rooms that were specialized instruction for small group instruction, for art, for music, have had to go onto carts and travel around, or even be done in the corridors. Some of the schools do not have two multi-purpose rooms, so they literally have their lunch service in the corridor, and actually a lot of students have to eat in classrooms. So a lot of the referendum is addressing their past needs as well as accommodating the program change in the future. One of the things that's happening with the demographics is that the demographics is slowing at the elementary schools because of the lower uh, birth rate, but it's still increasing at the middle school and in particularly at the high school. Now these are students already born and in the system. They're in first grade, second grade, third grade, but we're projecting out that when they hit the two high schools, um, J.P. Stevens will have a negative deficit of 900 seats. It currently has a negative deficit. It really is bursting at the seams right now. And so that's the total um, ramification. Edison High School will be closer to about 400 deficit of 400 seats when you build out for the, over that five to 10 year period where the students are there. And that's what they're trying to be proactive, particularly at the high school level, for what's going to happen, as well as shoring up those elementary and one middle school that are already over um, capacity. Uh, the temporary uh, uh, situation we have now with the classrooms, temporary additions that we've added on, is, are those rented? Do they go back, or are they just uh, do we do we own them? Or? 
Uh, okay. There's a combination. You have some trailer units that are very, very old that are kind of, you know, they, they're, they predated the current regulations. The current regulations by the Department of Education is that you have a window that you can use the trailers. And the window is typically you have an approval for a three year period, then you can get one or two more years added on working with your county superintendent. But the whole idea is that you only have a window of time short of going out for public referendums to get permanent facilities and that's what this is addressing so but are these rent are these units rent rented or do the, the, the no, board of education own all the, the the district owned them some of them were even pre you know uh, pre-used unit, uh, units that are there they have a much shorter lifespan so part of the thing is that a couple of them are really exceeding their existing lifespan for for um, serving as functional classrooms let alone being completely separate. Students literally have to go outside the building, unsecured, back and forth. So there's less instructional time as well as the security gaps with using, the, continuing to use the trailers. But it had to be done because there was such an immediate need for capacity. And so this, this is a virtually a catch up project, as you had mentioned. And a big portions catch up as well as, as I mentioned, that projection into the future for when the numbers hit the high schools, that's really being planned in time to capture that, that big gap of the high school because the high school's impact will be happening you know, in that five to 10 year period. So then in the entire project, if the board decided to go ahead with it, if it was approved or not, I think you had indicated it would take three years or four yes. years. Sounds mm -hmm. to me that at that time, at the end of the next three or four years, even if it was approved, we'd probably be at capacity at that point. Uh, one of the things that the uh, Department of Education regulates is how far you can project out demographics for um, anything from the middle schools on down, you can only project out five years and build for a five-year window. For high schools, they allow a 10-year window because the students are already in the system. So 10 years for high schools, five years for everybody else. So we. Our hand, the board's hands are tied in terms of they cannot go for approval for beyond that. But one of the things that we did do in this master planning approach was to make sure that even these schools that are being expanded, that there's still a pocket of space on the site for future expansion if and when potentially needed. So we wanted to make sure that's why we're doing the consolidated footprint approach. That's why we're building up. The whole idea is that we're trying to give the, the district flexibility for what may happen in the future. Um, as, as Edison continues to grow. Thank you. <laughs> Any other, other questions? Yes, Councilman? Madam Chair. Um, Jean, I, I had a question. You said that, that J.P. Stevens would have a negative deficit of 900 seats. And what was Edison High's negative deficit? About 400. 400. Yeah. And, and, the, and the difference there is that right now, J.P. Stevens is way over capacity. Right. Edison is just starting to feel the pinch. They're just starting to go into their overcapacity component. Well, Fifteen years ago, when <clears throat> my daughter graduated from J.P. Stevens, it was, it was, it was overcrowded right then, yeah, at mm -hmm. that point. She said she couldn't make it in the hallway. She had to carry her books because they wouldn't let her use a, a, you know, a backpack at the time for safety issues. Yes. And she yes. was always late for her class. So mm -hmm. 15 years ago, it was overcrowded. I can imagine yes. what it is now, and they didn't add anything onto it. No, and that's a good point because one of the things we're trying to do with addition is you can see we have infill, we have it in a couple different locations. That's intentional to try to expand the circulation so that you actually have more ways to move around the high school and less congestion in the central hallways. So we're trying to close loops and actually make it so they have multiple points so that students pass in different directions. We also have to massively expand the capacity for the special core areas. So what are the other schools that would be getting additional help, so okay. to speak. With so the, the two help. high schools are the, right. are the right. majority of the money and the majority of the square foot. Out of the uh, middle schools, it's Adams Middle School that's getting a two-story addition with a barrier-free elevator, because currently it has a second floor, but it's not barrier-free accessible. So this corrects that component, and that's adding a net gain of nine classrooms at Adams. At the three elementary schools, and these are the three elementary schools that are the most overcrowded and that have four trailers at each of them, and that includes Lincoln in the south, as well as Marshall in the south, and Madison Intermediate in the north side. So those are the three that are targeted. They're each getting around eight, nine classrooms in that range. Um, Lincoln is getting a multi-purpose room, um, and so is Madison Intermediate. Um, Marshall already has two multi-purpose rooms, so it's just getting a straightforward classroom addition. 
And that's it? Those are the schools that would be? Those were the ones that, it, it, the master plan, there was m many schools <laughs> that could really want to have more additions and other components, but this is where the Board of Education has drawn its line as the most critical needs, because these are the ones that have the most trailers currently and have the biggest uh, negative deficits with the seats. Um, one of the things that we did hear back from the state is that they have confirmed our long-range facility plan input of the data and have agreed with our calculation of the unhoused students. So we basically have gotten that uh, affirm you know, affirming um, support from the Department of Education. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Now we don't vote on this, but no, right. thank you for mm -hmm. the presentation. Mm -hmm. and um, you're going back to Trenton now, right? To get That's this right, yes. You have to go back to Trenton, and you'll be hearing more about this because there'll be open public forums, and the Board of Education will be trying to really communicate with the public. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Since we're on page two anyway, um, we were going to do final RAS 33 LLC. P11-2018. Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to ask Mr. Bignell the uh, request for a final approval. Can you give us an update? Have they performed? What yeah, this was the uh, piece of property across the street from um, Royal Albert's Palace, I believe. That's in Woodbridge. This part is in, in Edison. This is the parking area and then the food, the food preparation building. The board granted uh, preliminary site plan approval and variance approval. Uh, last year, I believe, and that was several conditions. Uh, the new site plan uh, provides all those conditions. The only thing I think is outstanding would be a facade of the building, but that's something we can do before uh, we sign off on reso compliance. So I believe that this is ready to go forward. He just has to have his outside agencies, and then he can move forward with that uh, with that project. But he did the landscaping. He uh, he lit the parking area. He shielded all that stuff. He did the uh, crosswalk for the for the employees to cross Woodbridge uh, Avenue. And uh, the plan is in conformance with the original preliminary approval. Madam Chair, on the basis of that testimony, I'd like to recommend that or make a motion that we uh, give final approval to RAS 33 LLC uh, P11 2018 with a note to make sure that that final uh, facade drawing is prepared before we go forward on it. Madam Chair, I'll second that motion. Okay, Lillian? Ms. Ruggieri? Yes. Mr. Pippola? Yes. Mr. Corrette? Yes. Council Member Zendelski? Yes, in the motion. Mr. Soltez? Yes. Mr. Peasy? Yes. Mr. Singh? Yes. yes. Oh, sorry. Mr. Danielle? Yes. Mr. Zing? Yes. <laughs> the final is approved. Okay, now we're going to go back yes. to page yes. one on our agenda. Um, we have a presentation from Bignell Planning Consultants on Mandy's Route Point 605-10-2017. Dash um, Mr. Bignell, the area in need of redevelopment. Uh, yes, ma'am, um, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, as you remember, you authorized us to go back and take a look at this property to see if it was in need of redevelopment. The property is um, 18 to 20 Vineyard Road. That's the study area. Uh, it's block uh, 1100, lot 37A, 1138A, 1139A. The um, council asked that we take a look at this thing uh, from that point of view, the need of redevelopment. It's a non-condemnation redevelopment study. Um, anybody that knows the area, it's, cross, it's, the, it's the front. The front of the property is really the back of the, uh, the Sam's Club up there on Vineyard Road in that area of the township. The uh, property is used for trucking and vehicle storage, has some garage space and office space. I believe it's a 1.4 uh, acre piece of property. Um, has a little bit of commercial on the one side, but it's all res surrounded by residential. So um, Mr. Todd in our office is going to give you the presentation. If you remember the, the criteria for a need of redevelopment, it only has to comply with one of those criteria, and it will give you our conclusion, and you guys can decide whether you agree or disagree, and we can move forward with that application. Okay, Mr. Todd. Good. good evening, board members. Good to be with you again. Uh, I'd like to just, just point I your... I swear you in. Uh, just test me about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
I do. I do. And state your name for the record, sir. Todd Bletcher. Henry Bignell. And you're a licensed professional planner? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If I could just direct your attention to the screen um, above you, and I'll try to go through this as quickly and expeditiously as, as I can. Uh, but uh, it, it is the 18 to 20 Vineyard Road study area. Uh, just to give you a very quick refresher on redevelopment process, I'm sure you're aware of this. The council designates the study area, the planning board studies and reports back to the council. The scope of this particular study, uh, the study analysis is provided in a report. It's revised through April 2nd. It consists of 16 pages. The, repile, the report is on file uh, in Ms. Triola's office since April of this year, and the findings of that report are offered as the justification for the redevelopment designation. My testimony tonight just summarizes that report, and I believe you do have a copy of the, the study in front of you? Okay. This is the study area. It contains three abutting lots. It's located on the west side of Vineyard Road between Chester Court and Maggie Road. The track is generally opposite the Vineyard Road frontage of the Sam's Club. It's effectively the rear wall of the Sam's Club in the uh, Ford redevelopment area. Combined track 1.44 acres of land. You can see on the tax map three individual parcels and it's clear to see that Residential development has developed around this site. These sites were obviously, or these lots existed first. Residential development came later. The site is occupied uh, by a business called Mandy's Towing. The building and the site were historically used as a local automotive repair garage and gasoline diesel fuel sales station. Records show the gasoline sales operation was terminated sometime around 2007, and the pumps and the tanks were removed after that. You can see the frontage of the site. It contains numerous cars, towing vehicles, and a three-bay repair garage. As you recall, an area of need of, of redevelopment can be deemed so if it satisfies any of the criteria that are found in the statute, A through effectively G, Buildings do not necessarily need to be abandoned or crumbling to qualify for redevelopment criteria. This report finds that the criteria D is met. That's the criteria that relates to obsolescence, overcrowding, or faulty arrangement and design. I'd like to show you some images of the site and show you exactly where that faulty arrangement and design can be observed. Uh, the report also notes that there are really three operations that are going on on this site. There's an automotive repair business, which is operated out of the 2,200 square foot uh, principal building, three repair bays, and it's used for general automotive repair, what we call local automotive service. Business maintains office hours 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday and 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturdays. You can see that there's limited parking in front of the building. Uh, parking spaces are not delineated, and that space between the front facade of the building and the front property line contains uh, cars that are parked waiting for service and also towing vehicles. There's also a towing business that operates on the site with a fleet of approximately 16 tow trucks. Tow trucks include flatbed trucks, tow hook tow trucks, and tractor truck style tow trucks used to tow other tractor trailers. The operator has a number of contracts with local police agencies for on-call towing services for inoperable vehicles. The towing element of the business operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The business tows several thousand vehicles per year. This facility often tows in disabled trucks and tractor trailers, which arrive at the site with both the tractor and the trailer being towed by a tow truck. Uh, effectively, it functions like an emergency dispatch center because of the arrangements that the operator has with these police agencies. Uh, when a vehicle accident occurs, uh, uh, essentially a tow truck is dispatched uh, the same way an emergency vehicle would be dispatched to a particular accident site. Just going back to the aerial, you'll see that the third use is a licensed impound yard which operates in connection with the towing business. Impounded vehicles are towed to the site and then are secured inside a rear fenced area that's on the upper left uh, portion of the, uh, of the rear yard. 
The facility impounds approximately 1,500 cars per, and or trucks per year, and the impound yard operates for police agencies on a 24-7 basis. You can just see visually, there's a lot of cars moving in and out of this space, and you can see the cars stacked on top three, four cars deep. Along the frontage of the site, the operator keeps a number of tow trucks uh, sort of positioned to be dispatched quickly to go to a, an accident scene. And those are staged in the front yard area, which essentially does not have enough room to contain the fleet of tow trucks and vehicles waiting repair and maintain adequate on-site circulation. You can see that the rear storage area is here. It contains shipping containers. It contains uh, damaged vehicles. It's not a paved area. It's essentially a gravel parking area that is used for vehicle storage. On the southern portion of the property, there is a detached single family home. It's on lot 39A. Commercial uses from the uh, trucking operation are encroaching onto this lot. This is an occupied dwelling. It's not uh, a building that's vacant. Um, it's just sort of uh, being used by the, by the the commercial operator, so the building is being essentially rented or occupied by a residential tenant. The three elements of the operations on the site create a significant need for general space for parking, vehicle repair storage, damaged vehicle storage, and truck fleet storage, as well as tow truck unloading and room for vehicle circulation. However, the current size and layout of the site does not provide sufficient layout for the intensity of this particular operation. The site's layout, which might have been suitable for smaller, less intense businesses in the past, is now obsolete for the current scale and operation for a number of reasons. First, the applicant, or the property owner rather, is operating an automotive repair business on the site which requires parking for employees and storage areas for vehicles waiting for service. However, the site provides no clearly marked parking stalls in the front yard for employees or for customers. Vehicles are parked haphazardly in pavement areas along the frontage of the building. Vehicle storage and truck fleet parking occur in a makeshift gravel area on the south side of the repair garage. There are no drainage, curbing, lighting, screening, or security improvements in those areas. The rear impound storage area is also an unpaved area, and the operator is not able to detect if fuels or fluid leaks from those damaged vehicles occur, nor manage contamination or contaminated runoff should they occur. There also exists a paved area on the northeast corner of the site, reserved for standby tow trucks. You saw that in a few images ago. Those tow trucks are waiting to be dispatched to an accident scene. The northern paved area leading to the rear impound yard is required to be kept accessible, which further limits front yard parking in this operation. Even with a more formal parking layout, the frontage of the site cannot provide, provide realistic parking for more than four to five vehicles without blocking site circulation for the other activities on the site. That situation alone would, clar would qualify for criteria D. Secondly, there is a towing operation on the site that contains a fleet of 16 tow trucks. They're very large vehicles. Larger trucks tow uh, other trucks with trailers. Since the business operates on a dispatch basis, the site operator stages several tow vehicles in the front yard to pull forward out of the site onto their destination. To facilitate this maneuver, the applicant needs to back these vehicles onto the site from Vineyard Road. This requires inbound vehicles to stop in the street, wait for traffic to clear in both directions, and essentially perform a K-turn in the right-of-way to back into the lot. This occurs on both the northeast and the southeast corners of the site. And since Vineyard Road is very obviously heavily traveled, this maneuver blocks the flow of traffic in both directions. There is not sufficient room on the property for direct-in maneuvering, which is essential. And this is a site layout problem that, again, supports the criteria D. Uh, lastly, the business maintains a fleet of commercial, commercial tow trucks in constant need of maintenance. 
many of these trucks, uh, the preference would be to store these vehicles inside, indoors, and perform that maintenance indoors. All of the vehicle maintenance on these particular vehicles uh, does not occur that way, it occurs uh, outside. Uh, so the applicant has expressed a um, potential desire to construct a vehicle storage building uh, on the site to perhaps store some of the uh, uh, tow trucks. Um, however, the site does not have the capacity and would not be able to contain uh, that particular building as well as the impound yard, as well as the fleet of vehicles, as well as the, the storage area for the repair vehicles. So the, ideally, the applicant would desire a lot approximately three acres, that's twice as big as we are right now, uh, in a more commercial or a more industrial setting where truck circulation can be better designed, where vehicle storage area can be better screened, and where unloading of damaged inoperable vehicles and impounding operations can have a properly designed uh, layout. For all of these reasons, the report finds that the operation has expanded beyond the capacity of the site. The site suffers from an obsolete layout caused by the location of the building and driveways, the need for excessive parking and vehicle storage, and the need for better truck circulation. Also, the need to back the vehicles into the site from Vineyard Road and the difficulty with unloading damaged or disabled vehicles from the site is further evidence of faulty arrangement described in criteria D. And I be available to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, Mr. Danielle. So this, this definitely sounds like it needs some work. Is this working? I'll talk loud. <clears throat> so is the applicant the owner of the property? Yeah, there's, there's a property. Technically, there's no applicant because it right. has not a development application, but they're the owner owns, the, the single uh, owner owns all three lots. So just educate me for one minute, because we got a long night. How did the town let this property get to this point? So are, are these any, are these, are there, like if it was Metuchen, I can't see this happening. Yeah. So how do we get to where we are? I'm, I'm okay with your recommendation, but I'm just curious how we got to where we are now. Well, it's probably a, uh, a, a use that was before the, the zone was put in place, so it's an existing legal non-conforming use. Um, and then the app, the owners of the property, whatever, they just kind of expand and expand and start adding things to the site, and then all of a sudden it doesn't fit anymore. They outgrow it. Right. But and, when I want to, excuse me, when and, I want to add something to my property, though, I got to come before zoning or planning. So what makes Well, I, I don't believe they're in violation of the zoning in, ter in terms of their pr prior uh, legal non-existence. So they, they, they can do what they want out there. It, the arrangement, the, the, the faulty stacking of vehicles, that's probably a problem, but that's not something that... Uh, that I guess the town goes around look, looking for. If you remember, the Ford plant was across the street, so it was all cars, you know, a few years back before they built the Sam's Club. That was just a, that was a, that was the auto plant. So it kind of like blended in both activities with stacking vehicles and not having. If you remember how they used to bring the Ford little Pintos out, they used to line them up in straight lines and be hundreds and hundreds of them, and they'd be trucking them constantly. So this operation or this area has changed in terms of what the what the uses are, and I I, I think it's just a. This is just a, uh, a bad byproduct of what was allowed, and now we're trying to straighten it out through redevelopment. So, and it is non condemnation, so it's the owners that are in, involved with the property. Okay, anyone else? Questions? Yes, Mr. Madam Pizzi? Chair, uh, Todd, uh, you mentioned the, the backing up, uh, making the K turn, backing up with the big big units uh, and what also happens at that time you have the beep 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 and sometimes they take the because uh, uh, there are 24 hours that they're, they're a, uh, they, they uh, take cars off of the turnpike and, and such they, they have a contract with turnpike so anytime the hour you can hear that beep 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 backing up so this is definitely a need and it, it, it's obsolete, and it definitely needs of some kind of uh, redevelopment. I'd agree. Yes. I'm sorry. The, the uh, mic doesn't seem to be working. Yes, it is. Yours is working. Mine's working. Yes. Oh. So, Madam Chair, what we? I'm need willing to share, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, we need a vote. Okay. Madam yes. Chair. Yes. Mr. Uh, Pippola. Todd, on that uh, the two adjacent lots, 36A and 35A, is, is there sure. a, 
It's a strip mall or a small strip. What's over there? Yeah, there's a little strip mall to the north of the site. The little Genius Academy is in there. There's a skateboard uh, type store in there and a little uh, child care center in there. And also in your report, I think confirming Mr. Bignell's uh, recent comments that it was approved in the early 60s and this just grew from that point on, it sounds like. Yes, it has and uh, essentially there are there are uses on the site that have grown, and, and that's a good thing for businesses in town that they're able to grow and, and do well, but it, it's, it's, it's occurring on a site that really doesn't have the capacity to contain how well this business has grown. Similar to Mr. Uh, Danielle's remarks out in, you know, no control. Thank you. Madam Chair, yes, I have yes, a question for Todd. And so ha have the owners of the property been getting complaints from the neighbors in the neighborhood regarding their operations, how it's expanded and the backup of the trucks and the increased operations? Uh, Mr. Sandelsky, I, I asked the property owner that question when I interviewed him uh, and um, his response to me was that, was that no, there wasn't a, a chronic problem of complaints. Um, and essentially a lot of, the, of the, the residential dwellings that are located around the property have purchase those homes or come to the situation knowing that this use has been here for the past 40 years. So it was, it was not sort of a surprise situation that all of a sudden at 2 o'clock in the morning they're back in, in tractor trailers. It's always been occurring and, um, and that's how it was, it was explained to me. It seems like that, like we were talking about, that whole area is transitioning out of the industrial automotive type use. Right. Similar to what we had with Clayton Block. And this is, this is an opportunity now for the town to help clean this right. property up and get it to a more modern state. Right, because there was no site improvement permits, no engineering permits, no drainage, nothing going on in that site, which this would give us an opportunity to do that, similar to what we're doing now on Route 1 there where the Clayton Block property is and, and where the Ford plant was, so yes. to clean it up and, and create some better rateables for the town. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone Chair? else? Any other questions? Just, just oh, one. Mr. Peasy? Uh, yes, Todd, on 39A. Uh, 39 yeah, 39A, the, where the building is. Are they going to raise that building? Yeah, Mr. Breezy, I, I, I'm not, there's no specific plan for the site right now. I would anticipate that any future use here has to include all three lots. Okay. Because it's, I mean, it's small enough right now. It's only 1.4 acres, the entire tract. So I'd assume, realistically, anyone who's going to use it is going to need the entire thing. Thank you. Okay. So the next step is we're, we're sending it to council. If we agree with yes. the determination as to the um, criteria D. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve Mr. Bignell's uh, uh, recommendation that this area is indeed in need of uh, redevelopment and forward it to our con to, uh, council. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'd like to wait, 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 before we vote. Madam Chair, just yes. a quick question for your attorney, uh, if we need to open to the public or not. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, it's good Thank you. Okay. At this point, then, I apologize. Um, anyone who would like to speak as to this redevelopment, please come forward. Your name and address. Seeing no one come forward, make a motion. We close public portion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve Mr. Bignell's recommendation for. Uh, Mandy's R605-10207 as an area in need of redevelopment and forwarded back to the town council. Madam Chair, I'd like to second that motion. Okay. Lillian? Ms. Ruggieri? Yes. Mr. Pippola? Yes. Mr. Correct? Yes. Council Member Sandelsky? Yes on the motion. Mr. Soltes? Yes. Mr. Peasy? Yes. Mr. Singh? Yes. Mr. Danielle? Yes. Mr. Zing? Yes. The to go back to Thank you. Okay, the next one is also redevelopment uh, presentation from Bignell Planning on JK Estates R.178 I guess it's 03 2019. And Mr. Bignell? You ready? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, this is another uh, uh, area in need of redevelopment study that the uh, planning board asked us to take a look at. Why don't I squeeze both in? Why Again? Solemnly swear for him testimony about to give the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do. I do. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. McNeil. Okay. Uh, again, a, a non-condemnation redevelopment, need a redevelopment study. 
It's um, commonly known as 1696 Oak Tree Road. Um, the block is block 546I, lot 37. I believe it's approximately 7.5 uh, acres. Um, if the board will remember, this piece of property um, was, was a chemical air, chemical acetylene uh, uh, a facility, and I think it was started in 1947 and shut down in 2004. And since then, the buildings have kind of been removed. Uh, there was some uh, 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 contamination on the site. And, but the board uh, did have an approval for, uh, I think it was called the Golden Mall, as far as an 80,000 square foot uh, strip mall. But with that approval came a lot of improvements for the highway, the road, the frontage, the traffic. And I think it got to the point where it was just very, very uh, expensive. So they needed a little more oomph to get this thing moving forward. So again, um, uh, we looked at it for a need of redevelopment. I believe there's a couple of criteria that this one qualifies under. And Todd, again, will go through the study and uh, you know tell you what our findings were. Okay. So this is the redevelopment study for 1696 Oak Tree Road study area. Uh, you're familiar with the redevelopment process. We'll skip right to the scope of the study. Uh, the report. It's 24 pages plus an appendix. It's revised through May 24th, 2019, and it has been available for public inspection since May 24th of this year. The findings of the report are offered as the justification for the redevelopment designation, and my testimony tonight just summarizes that report. You are aware that property can be deemed in need of redevelopment if it meets any of the criteria. And in this case, criteria C and D are satisfied. Let me show you the parcel. <clears throat> this is the lot. This is the images from 2019. It's a single parcel, 7.65 acres. Block 546I, lot 37. It's a former industrial site with an extensive history of environmental contamination and ongoing remediation. The property was undeveloped land until about 1947 and then developed as a gas, uh, atmospheric gas manufacturing facility. I'd like to take you, show you the historic image just so you can see what it looked like. And I understand it's a little bit blurry, but that's the best photograph we have um, pre-1990, essentially. Um, but you can see in the lower left-hand corner of the site, there is a um, a manufacturing plant, and on the lower right-hand corner of the lot, there is what is effectively is an office building. And there's paved parking areas in between. This image is somewhere early 1990s, late 1980s. So let's go back to the uh, 2019 image. It's a little clearer, and I think it's easier to see what was going on out there. This is the 2019 aerial. You can see in this section of the image here, the site contained an industrial acetylene and oxygen plant on the southwest corner of the site. Office building, commercial building, was located on the southeast corner of the site. And you can also see the paved parking area between the two buildings. From 1947 to 1984, acetylene gas was produced there. Part of that chemical process created a byproduct of calcium hydroxide, uh, which is effectively lime slurry that was created from the production of those gases. <coughs> That lime slurry was pumped into a lime slurry pond that was in the rear portion of the site. The pond has been removed, but the pond was there previously. The site has uh, one driveway provided from Oak Tree Road, paved driveway, two-way uh, traffic, and that driveway is still present on the site. You can see the uh, frontage of Oak Tree Road. The site is fenced. Tractor trailers are effectively trespassing on the site. There's no approval to use it for tractor trailer use or storage or anything. They're just parked there. Uh, you can see in this image that this is the central paved parking area. There's dumping occurring on the site. There were material stockpiles of soil and stone and debris. This is the rear portion of the site that looks like a grass field now, but it, it previously contained the uh, above ground lime slurry storage pond. And again, you see the dumping materials, concrete debris. The site is, is totally accessible. There's no, there's a, <clears throat> the driveway provides a, a fence, but 
there's effectively no gate. Anyone can go onto the site. And uh, Is that a health hazard that we can just have anybody in this town go in and work? Again, this is another example. What? Who's watching? What's going on here? So somebody can dump hazardous Let me finish. Yeah. Hazardous material. There's no gate. Who owns the property right now? Uh, the, the same developer who secured the approval. That's the JK. So should we ask JK to put a lock on it and to do something so now we can just go dump there? People in other towns. You, you make a very good point. Uh, Mr. Danielle, but the problem is that we don't do the enforcement. No, no, we can I'm make not, a recommendation. I'm, I'm, I'm not asking you. I'm just. It's an enforcement issue between probably the health department and then zoning. So and if you Mr. like, Sikowski, we can certainly. You're, you're the council representative. We can have people dumping very serious things on here and nobody saying anything. So we don't, we can't have a policeman there. They're, they're stretched too thin. We can't require them to have a lock or, you know, I, I don't get it. Good point. So, you're on the council, you're representative. Could you bring this up and say, it's a health hazard. What if some kids start playing baseball? Because that grass doesn't need any lime. Obviously, it's grown pretty well. It just <laughs> seems to be a problem here. It, who's watching? I will bring it to Mr. Elliott's attention. All right. I mean, there should be a fence there. What, what, what's in that stuff there? It's just, it's like a run of well, That looks like it's just grading material that, that was taken off a road somewhere and some curbing but, and you have broken a, you concrete. Have, you have a trailer. What's going on in that trailer? Somebody running a, a business? It's, it's hard to tell. With our site inspections, it, there's no activity other than the vehicles being parked there and seeing the debris. If I was piles. a neighbor there, I'd be concerned what, what's yeah. going on there. That could well, that's, that's probably a real good reason to get this thing developed as fast as we can, too. So. Uh, the report relies on criteria C, and that is applicable to unimproved vacant land that has remained vacant for 10 years. and also land that by virtue of its location or remoteness or soil conditions has had frustrated uh, uh, development. The report also finds the site complies with criteria D, which is the faulty arrangement or design obsolete layout criteria. So I'd like to show you how this applies and I'd like to go back into the historic mm -hmm. images we're going to go back to this images from the early 1990s. You can see the, the <clears throat> settling plant on the property. Fast forward to 2002, Air Products was still operating on the site. They terminated industrial activities in the end of 2002. The plant was demolished in 2003. And fast forward to 2006, you can see the buildings are gone uh, and the site is essentially vacant. Fast forward again to 2019, that's where we are today. That C criteria requires us to show that the site has been vacant for a period of 10 years or more. This is from 2019. The previous image was from 2006. That's more than 10 years. So that satisfies the first prong of criteria C. The second prong of C relates to soils on the site. Now, environmental investigations have actually been conducted on the site as far back as 1980. There are several thousand pages of environmental studies and reports for this site. We obviously didn't attach those to this report, and what we relied on was the most recent summary update of all of those environmental investigations, something called the 2016 Remedial Investigation Report. It was prepared by Langen Engineering, and we provided a reference and a link to that in the appendix of our report. So if someone wanted to get that, you could go and, and get that original report. Essentially what it says is that there were 57 individual areas of contamination on the site, including lead in the soils, buried acetylene cylinders, leaking underground storage tanks, material spills, instances of soil and groundwater contamination. There are several monitoring wells on the site that are present. The image is a little bit difficult to see, but if you can see on the left side of the image, there's all sorts of little labels that point to little black dots on the map. Those are uh, uh, monitoring wells that are present on the site. There are still ongoing issues with soil, I'm sorry, groundwater contamination and vapor intrusion still being monitored, still present on the site. <clears throat> Since 2017, deed restrictions have been in place on the site. <clears throat> relating to specific areas where buildings cannot be permitted. Contamination areas as well as those 
locations are shown here on this map. It's called the restricted maintenance area map. This impacts where development can and can't go on the site, and effectively that meets the second criteria, or second prong of criteria C. Well, he's taking a drink. I just want to point out to the board, too, that Air Products was uh, more than gracious to allow us to use their reports on the contamination and stuff, so they let us have and use that information. So we were grateful. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Peasy. Uh, Todd, you mentioned that there was some re remedial action taken. Is uh, all the contamination taken care of? All of the contamination is not taken care of. Uh, of those 57 areas of contamination, most of them, including the soils, have been remediated. There was some 240 tons of soil that have been removed from that site. Uh, what remains is the groundwater contamination and issues with what's called vapor intrusion. That's contaminated groundwater, worried about vapors sort of coming up from the ground. Those are ongoing. That's what the monitoring wells are for. Those wells need to be effectively forever need to be accessible. And that's why there are areas of the site that cannot be developed anymore. Can't put a building on top of it, need to be able to get to the monitoring well to test it. Mm. Madam Chair, yes. I, I have a question. Todd, Todd, can you tell me, the site is basically dissected into two par parcels there. You have a cross-hatched area, a dark area, and a dashed area of like two humps there. Could you explain what that is? Sure. I would. I read that, and I, and I took a closer look at that before. As the the restricted area is the darkest sort of area on the map on the far left or left side of the right. image. Uh, that's the restricted area. Uh, in addition to that restricted area, the monitoring wells. Really, the deed restriction relates to making sure that those monitoring wells can't be uh, built disturbed. on top of disturbed, disturbed. Um, and that. If there's perpetual monitoring, someone's got to be able to get to those. Can't put a building around it. Can't put a you know parking around it. It's got to be continually accessible so that someone can go and test those wells. And so, what is the dashed area there? Uh, you know what? I'd have to take a look at the um, the plan to tell you exactly what the what the different that that dashed layer is. I'm not sure. And the and the diagonal cross hatched area. Let me see if I can see it in here. I <laughs> couldn't see it. I couldn't. Yeah, what it's called is the, um, the, cro the cross-touch area, I believe it says general land use restricted area. That's what it's called, land use restricted area. Okay, so yeah. would any development be happening on the right side of the property then? Is that, is that what? The, the restrictions, we'd have to look at the actual text of the deed restriction to see exactly what's restricted. It might say you can build on top of it as long as you cap it as yeah. long as you provide you know, access to the monitoring wells. So we'd have to go through, and that was not part of the scope of our study uh, to do that, but that's how we'd have to figure out exactly what the language of that deed restriction permits and doesn't permit. Ultimately, a developer is gonna have to do that to see what, make sure whatever development gets proposed out there doesn't violate the language of that deed restriction. And the right side, where there is no demarcations there, is clean, basically, right? That, that's No clean. deed restrictions. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. thank you. Uh, there's also a second prong of the, uh, the C criteria is <clears throat> satisfied in other ways by virtue of its location. I thought this image was uh, sort of telling because you can see that this is the last large vacant lot in the center of the Oak Tree Road retail corridor. It's the only, gr it's like, you know, uh, effectively green piece of property left. Everything else has been developed. That area, of course, a massive retail economic engine for the township. Uh, secondly, by way of its location, the lot has 667 feet of frontage on Oak Tree Road. Oak Tree Road is a five-lane cross-county highway, two eastbound, two westbound, and one central turning lane. The nearest traffic control signals are here and here. They're approximately 750 feet away from the site. The volume of traffic on Oak Tree Road, along with the spacing of the lights to the east and west of the site, do not create sufficient gaps in traffic to allow for outbound left turn movements. This is not only my conclusion, but this was <clears throat> raised by the planning board in 2014. And that is why in the resolution of approval, you required as condition 3C that the applicant uh, at that time fully design and fund the installation of a traffic control signal and new intersection 
along the site frontage, and that would be here in alignment with Dayton Drive. Madam, Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Peasy. I just have a, a, a question for our, our, our attorney, uh, Mike Rubin. Mike, uh, if we grant a uh, area of redevelopment, does the township uh, have any liability on, on the um, contaminated areas? Only if they take ownership. Okay, and, and we're not taking ownership, we're merely, okay. Right. So notable here is the sheer size of the property and the volume of retail and restaurant visitors that would be expected. The 2014 plan approved uh, 80,000 square feet of uh, retail space. Obviously that would need to be modified, but that plan required over 440 parking spaces on the site to support that use. The cost of constructing an entirely new intersection including the cost burden of land acquisition on the south side of Oak Tree Road, where the applicant does not, or the property owner, does not own any property, frustrates development, potential for the site. The site is not developable for any use without those public improvements to control traffic at a new intersection along the frontage, and that in turn satisfies criteria C. So in conclusion on criteria C, we need to show you 10 years of prior uh, um, vacancy prior to the adoption of the resolution. First, it com meets the second prong based on environmental conditions. It meets the second prong based on, by virtue of its location on o Oak Tree Road and the location of the traffic signals that are near the site. And the public improvement, that public improvement is not likely to be developed through the instrumentality of private capital alone. That is how the site, again, cri meets criteria C. There's also a finding of criteria D that relates to the location of the existing driveway. Development surrounding the property has evolved in the last 30 years to become retail and residential in nature. From a land use perspective, this change to the surrounding environment makes it obviously obsolete for redevelopment as a heavy industrial or even light industrial property. Since the site is located within the Oak Tree Road Retail Corridor, which has been developed into a very lucrative economic engine for the township, the site has obvious value for retail or mixed use redevelopment. However, this development can only come with the removal of the site's single remaining improvement, which is the dilapidated driveway along the fronts of the site and the realignment of that driveway with Dayton Drive, which by the way is not a public street. Dayton Drive is a privately owned uh, driveway, and again, that contributes to the frustration and complication here of how we can create a new intersection aligning with that private driveway. Uh, without this change, circulation problems and questionable emergency access described in the report would not only frustrate development, they would all negatively impact the health, safety, and welfare of the public. So in conclusion, the site can meet the redevelopment criteria for criteria C and criteria D, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, any questions? Let's go to the public. Okay, at this point I'll open to the public. Is there anyone that would like to speak as to this redevelopment? Okay, please come forward. Your name and address. Good evening, Mary Ann Hennessy, 20 Carmelo Drive. I had a question on one of the slides that was put up. Uh, the, the property indicated tents, white tents on the property. Was that for the remediation and the testing? No, I believe the, the property has been used um, for one of the local parades. I think the property, since it's vacant, I think the property is actually used as a staging sort of area for some of the parades that occur in, in the, uh, I'm not sure if anyone's been to those, but I, it, it, they, they were tents, sort of like parade, tents and parade barriers and I can show you. Is that a permitted use right now? There you go. Yeah, that's Is that a permitted use right now? It's a temporary use, it's not. Not a problem? No. With all the, so with all the chemicals there and everything, it's, that's okay. That's not, that portion of the site, there's no chemicals. So it's the other portion of the site to the left that yes. has the major amount of contamination? 
Uh, in this image, the contamination is to the left of the driveway. Okay. It's being remediated. No. You have to understand that um, the property is being remediated. It's being monitored. Uh, it's it's they're 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 doing all the things they're supposed to do. The big corporation went and did did, did their uh, their due diligence. Uh, and the other point was the development won't be allowed to be on that property until they get to a level that, that meets the, a, a commercial standard and then a residential standard, if there's any of that. So the, the, there's a lot of criteria that have to go into place before any kind of development. I had another question. Yeah, Mr. Danielle. So yeah, I heard you use the word mixed use. So there could be houses on there someday? There could be, yeah, there could be, um, there could be residential, sure. We haven't decided on any of that no, stuff no, yet. I'm, ju I'm just asking. I'm just saying it, it certainly can be part of the redevelopment, whatever, whatever the uh, uh, the board was going to determine. We'll, 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 okay. we'll, we'll propose that to you at some point. Might be senior housing. I've heard that. I mean, things that don't impact on the community and, and, and help with the economics. But we can't limit that to senior housing in our plan of redevelopment. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you can in the redevelopment plan. You can talk about, you know, what type of development you want. Sure. Any projected idea of how long for the remediation? Most of the remediation has occurred and is, is complete. The remaining issues, which is the groundwater and the vapor mm -hmm. contamination, are ongoing and could be ongoing forever. What does, you have to understand, I'm not as well educated in this as a lot of you are, but Groundwater contamination. Mr. Bicknell, you and I can chat. I'm comfortable. That can spread. The water, groundwater contamination, can it spread towards the rear of the property and into residential, or is it somehow contained to not go that way? Well, it's, it's been remediated, and what happens is there's a plume underground, and the, and the plume goes to a certain... They've tested the different areas, and I'm sure if you look at the, go back to that map, you see where they had um, uh, the wells that go down and, and test. And, they, and they're monitoring it now. So I don't believe there's, it's, it's not considered a super fund or anything like that, but it's been monitored, and it's being, it's being remediated. Oh, it'll just be over time that it'll dissipate, I guess, at some point, because they're not adding pollution to it. And all the soils that contained all that crazy stuff in it, all the tons of soil, mm -hmm. that's all been removed from the site. So they may just have to cap it, and then that takes care of the, uh, the, the DEP requirements. So if you cap it, bear with me. Yeah, if you won't you, be playing in it. You won't be digging in it. You won't, that's why they, they cap things like that. So when they, when they cap that area, that area also has to be kept clear to be able to go in and monitoring that capped area? The, um, the um, DEP already has the areas where they have the wells in place, so that's all they want now. Okay. So they've, they've looked at it, and they're, I'm sure they're, they're, uh, they're satisfied because they have those monitoring wells, and, they're, and, I, and they have to look at it like regularly. They go okay. take samples and stuff. Okay. All right. right. It's the same thing like when we did the um, the old Revlon property and we did that need of redevelopment over there. There were certain areas where it was contaminated and they, they pretty much cap it and it's, it's doesn't and affect it's, anyone anymore. And it was clearly delineated yes. that no housing could go on it, well, et cetera. There's certain <laughs> levels now. The DEP will decide what level of development can be there. There's a certain clean level for commercial and there's a certain higher level for, for residential. They won't let you build residential on a on a um, uh, contaminated site if it doesn't meet their standard or what parts per million of yeah. any kind of chemical can be in the ground. Okay, as I right. say, I'm, I'm, st I'm still trying to... It's up to, to the DEP to decide like what level okay. they, can, they can construct at, right? We haven't gotten to that point yet. Now, will it take more years? Oh, I'm sure it's going to take a little more time. If you start with the approval process, that'll probably take, you know, when they add stuff, like, that could take up to a year there. Then you're looking at DEP to look at the application itself, and that, there's some time involved there. So it can take a little, still takes more time. That's why, you, that's the problem. It's not being redeveloped because it's just so expensive, and so that's the need of redevelopment. <laughs> that's that's New Jersey's way of trying to help communities uh, provide rateables and you know things that you know help the community. Okay, All one right. minor small question: Is that what's considered brownfields? Mm, I, 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 you know, in in that I, sense. I, it's a contaminated site. I'm not sure it's a brownfield. Okay. All, All right. right. Thank you. Hank, Hank, I don't, I don't think it's the level of a brownfield. Yeah. You know, I mean, depending on the type of use ultimately that's found for the site, certain levels like you can use the capped area for parking and things like that, but you can't use it like for a playground or something like that. Yeah, and I, and, and and the soil's going to be at a certain level before DEP will even grant an approval, and I'm sure with the deed restrictions on the property, that's going to be part of any kind of 
approval of the Bortle grant. Right. And like you said, they'll be monitoring this thing forever. They'll be going out there and checking those monitoring yeah. wells. And I'm sure if there was a problem now, they'd be out there like every day oh. looking at it. You know, the white suits. They're Absolutely. not doing that anymore. Absolutely. And this, and this, the remediation, by the way, is the soil's been remediated. That's that's taken care of. Really, the ongoing thing is the well that goes several hundred feet down into the ground that monitors the groundwater 100 feet below the site, and uh, those groundwater just travels the way you know. Yeah. Groundwater naturally travels, and there could be contamination washing out at a stream 3,000 feet away. From they, they from want the to make so. sure that there's no aquifer issues going on there. Exactly. That's what they want. Exactly. Okay, anyone else from the public that would like to speak? Seeing no one come forward, i um, like to make a motion we close public portion. Hey, do I have a second? Six. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Yeah. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the recommendation from Mr. Brignell that this uh, subject property does meet criteria C and D. Uh, qualifying it as an area in need of redevelopment and forward that on to the council. Madam Chair, I'd like to second the motion and, and just uh, mention to Todd, nice, Todd, nice, nice job, Todd. Thank you. Okay, Lillian? Ms. Ruggieri? Yes. Mr. Pippola? Yes. Mr. Perrette? Yes. Council Member Sandelsky? Yes, on the motion. Mr. Soltes? Yes. Mr. Deasy? Yes. Mr. Singh? Yes. Mr. Danielle? Yes. Mr. Zing? Yes. This is approved to go to council. Okay, on the agenda, old business, none. On to new business. P9 dash. Oh, oh okay. Okay. So I'm just, I'm just gonna. Five minute break? Okay. So we're gonna take a five minute break and come back for new business. This is one of my pet peeves, why I don't give a break, is it's never five minutes. So meeting, please come to order. Okay, under new business, P9-2019, Shopping Center Associates, the corner of Lafayette and Route 1, Block 691.B, Lots 6.J, 6.K, 6.M, and 7.E. Good evening. Merrill Goncher, Sills, Cummins, and Gross, and we are here this evening representing Shopping Center Associates, the applicant. Uh, as you've noted, uh, the property is identified as 691, block 691B, lot 6J, 6K, 6M, and 6E on the current tax map, and is also known as 1521 US 1, and it's on the southbound side, with frontage on US 1, on Lafayette Avenue, and on Parsonage Road. We're here this evening seeking preliminary and final site plan approval, together with um, a few C variances, and our application seeks to develop an approximately 12,285 square foot building, which we propose at the present time to be occupied by two restaurants in that single building, a Shake Shack and a True Food Kitchen, uh, which will replace the building previously occupied by Macaroni Grill, which as you know, it's been vacant for some time. Uh, we are seeking, as I indicated, a couple of C variances um, one is for a front yard setback. Um, there are three frontages on this property. Uh, we are meeting the front yard setback on two out of the three, but with regard to the frontage on Lafayette, we're seeking a variance to permit 11.65 um, foot front yard where 50 is permitted. We do meet the 50 as I indicated at the other two. Uh, we're also seeking a variance for um, also along Lafayette. Uh, where you require five feet from the property line uh, for parking setback. Um, we are below five feet, but this is an existing condition. We are maintaining the current condition. Um, the other variances, which I won't go through at the moment, but we will discuss as we move through, have to do with proposed signage at the site. Um, 
we um, have submitted our application, our plans, and a number of reports and would ask that those be considered part of the record. I don't believe that the practice here is to mark them individually. Uh, we will have our witnesses identify most recent revisions, so we're all working from the same plan set. We propose three witnesses this evening. Uh, Stephen Hoyt from Pannoni Engineering, our civil engineer. Walter, I'm going to mispronounce this, we'll get it clarified. Pasevich, uh, our architect with ARIA, and uh, Keenan Hughes uh, from Phillips Price, Grigel, Laney, and Hughes, um, who will be our planner in uh, providing testimony in support of our uh, variance applications this evening. Uh, we also have a representative of the application here. We don't propose to present him for direct testimony, but obviously if you have questions, he's available to answer them. Um, notice was mailed to all required parties by certified mail. Uh, notice was published in the Home News Tribune, and we have submitted both an affidavit of publication and an affidavit of service, and would ask that the board acknowledge that uh, jurisdiction is properly before the board and service was properly affected. We're okay with the, you, we've reviewed the um, affidavits and we're good to go. Thank you. Um, we'd like to start with our first witness, Stephen Hoyt. We'd ask that he be sworn. You solemnly swear a firm testimony about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Please state if you spell your last name for the record. Last Stephen. name is Hoyt, H-O-Y-T. <laughs> first name, Stephen. Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Um, I work at Pannoni Associates. It's located at 24 Counter Street, Suite 300, North New Jersey, 7102. Uh, I have a Bachelor's of Science degree in Civil Engineering at JIT. I graduated in 2013. I've employed at Pannoni Associates since that time. I received my professional engineering license in New Jersey in 2017. I've been practicing since. And have you ever testified at this board? No, as I was just going to say, this is Mr. Hoyt's first appearance as a professional engineer before any board. So be kind, but we'd like to ask that the board accept him based upon his education and his license as an expert in the field of engineering. And we shall accept you. Thank you. See, you're over the first time. Um, okay, could you please identify the plans that we'll be reviewing this evening, um, the most recent revisions that should be before the board? Most recently submitted plans are dated May 15th, 2019. Okay. Um, and if you could just, um, now we, the boards that we've put up, which are way yonder at the other side, I don't know if we want them moved over, they are the plans that are in the set. We have not rendered them, so I don't know that it's necessary to mark them as exhibits. Um, do you want to be happy with them on there? Or you want to speak them? So, yeah, we do mark them as they want. The yes. whole set is A1. The whole set is A1, yeah. thank you. And can the camera get it in that corner there? We can move it over. We were trying to put it somewhere so the public could see it, but since you're working from the same plan, we could certainly move it over. That would be good, I think, if that, and if you could turn it sort of sideways so the audience can see it as well. Just move back a little bit more because then the people in the audience can't see it. Well, you know what it's supposed to These are the things they don't teach you, right? <laughs> You're doing this because it's his first time. You know? Now they're going to have to move it over here and then back there. <laughs> it's nice moving around and you get to the same spot again. Esther's going to she's going to teach take you. Care of Good. And I'm just going to remind you to speak into the microphone That's so that everyone right. can hear your testimony. Steve, could you just start by, uh, we've identified the lot and block, but if you could just orient the board and the public by the surrounding streets and then go on to please describe the existing conditions at the site. Okay, this lot is bounded by Lafayette Avenue, Parsonage Road, and Route 1. It's across from the Seasons 52. There's a McDonald's on Route 1 over here. Further down, there's a Sonic. That's that corner where Route 1 meets Parsonage. 
Um, the existing site features the macaroni grill building. Um, there's associated parking, lighting, landscaping that had to do with that previous tenant. Um, and what are we proposing to do with the, with the site? We are proposing to knock down the existing building and develop a single building that houses two restaurants, um, the Shake Shack and the True Foods. With that, there's parking lot improvements. The orientation of the parking changes a little bit. There was previously two driveways to Lafayette Avenue. Their proposed application has one driveway out to Lafayette Avenue. Some associated sidewalk changes with that. Um, let's um, discuss uh, when the project um, is, well, let's discuss the lot currently. Um, can you discuss the bulk requirements with regard to the lot and what zone the property is located in? The property is located in the general business highway district. Uh, proposed use as a restaurant, which is permitted in that zone. Going through some of the bulk requirements, minimum lot area is 20,000 square feet. This lot features 102,480 square feet. Uh, the lot width is 100 square feet, or 100 feet is the requirement. The lot is 146.52 feet wide. The depth requirement is 125 feet. This lot provides 500 feet depth from Parsonage. It's 200 feet deep from Lafayette to Route 1. The lot is unique in that it has three frontages. Each street acts as a frontage, and then there's a side yard to the neighboring property. Okay. The um, could you, I had mentioned, so if you could just identify that um, looking at the frontage along Lafayette, um, there is a requirement for 50 feet um, along each of them. Can you just identify um, where uh, Lafayette is and what are we proposing in terms of the setback and also the parking setback? So Lafayette is the street to the plan north, north of the site. The setback of 11.65 feet occurs here at the corner of the building closest to it. The parking setback <coughs> occurs at the northeast corner. That's the existing curb line that we're looking to maintain because there's some frontage planning there that's going to be saved as part of this application. And Steve, five feet is required. What is the proposal? Uh, what is the current condition with regard to the parking setback and the proposed condition? The current condition is 4.11 feet. Okay, and that's what we're maintaining? Correct. Um, okay, and um, what is the um, permitted coverage, uh, both impervious and building, and what are we proposing? Impervious coverage, the allowable is 80% maximum. Currently, with the macaroni grill site, it's at 80.1%. This application proposes to reduce the impervious coverage to 77.42%. Uh, it's mainly achieved through a reduction in the parking lot size. Uh, building coverage does increase from 8% to 12%, while the allowable is 25%. Okay, so both impervious and building coverage are proposed to be compliant based upon this proposal. Correct. Thank you. Um, okay, now um, you mentioned that um, the there are currently two driveway entrances. Can you uh, just reiterate for the board where those accesses are from and what is what are we proposing to change about the access? So flipping back to CS0501, there's two existing driveways to Lafayette, one on the west side, one on the east side of the existing building. In order to construct the new building containing two restaurants, it shifts about 50 feet to the east, which would be in line with the previous driveway. Therefore, we're proposing to close that. The sidewalk that I touched on that runs along the frontage of the building and then stops at that driveway will be reduced to stop at the west side of the new building. Um, now, the, um, the circulation, the, so we now have one access onto the site. Can you describe um, how circulation will work on the site around the building? So I'll touch on pedestrian circulation first, and then we'll get into the vehicle circulation. Yep. Um, 
pedestrians where they park, they get to go through the parking lot. The building's surrounded by sidewalk, which will take you to the front entrances of either side. Um, as I mentioned, there's sidewalk along Lafayette that used to stop at the driveway that now stops at the west side of the building and connects to that sidewalk that encompasses the building. Uh, as part of the review process, we have vehicle circulation, um, which shows the Edison emergency vehicle, the SU-47 fire truck, and we have the SU-40 box truck, which is anticipated for deliveries and garbage pickup. Both are shown to circulate the site without disrupting the parking areas. Um, they come in off of Lafayette. They can make the turn, circulate the parking lot, pick up whatever they need to. There's a loading area on the northeast corner where there are dumpsters. You can also back a delivery vehicle in there, then pull out of the site. Okay, so circulation is adequate and safe for the intended vehicles as well as emergency vehicles? Correct. All right, thank you. Um, I don't know how you want us to deal with this. We do have letters from both of our consultants. I would note that the DNR review letter um, item 2.2 acknowledges that they have reviewed our truck circulation plan um, and uh, just noting that we have provided that information. Um, can you um, address the parking on the site, where the parking is provided, how we calculate it, and whether we meet the requirements of the ordinance in terms of the number and the size of the parking spaces? Sure. Parking's provided Throughout the site, there's three main lots on the west side. You have parking along the Route 1 frontage, and then you have two rows of parking on the east side. Um, the calculation for parking, the ordinance requires the greater of a requirement based on either dining room square footage or number of seats. In our case, the greater number was based on the dining area square footage. Um, that requirement is 152 spaces. This application is proposing 185 parking spaces. That's reduced from 204 parking spaces that are currently there. Of that 185 spaces, six of them are accessible. We distributed them three on the west side, three on the east side, so each restaurant has ADA spaces. And does that, um, do those, the number of ADA compliant spaces meet the requirements of all applicable regulations? Yes, for 151 to 200 spaces, six is the requirement. Okay. Um, okay. Um, the, um, I think you identified where the dumpster was located. Um, I would note that there was a comment which we will address with our planner as to the location of the dumpster and whether that um, is compliant with the, um, with the ordinance. Um, can you describe um, whether all required utilities are available for the site and how they will be provided? I will jump ahead to this is sheet CS1701. Uh, that being there's an existing restaurant there, all the utilities are pretty much fed from Lafayette Avenue. Um, the proposed condition mimics that. Uh, we're actually grabbing a couple of the feeds to the site within the property line to limit the disruption in Lafayette Avenue. So there's sewer, electric, water, gas, all come from Lafayette Avenue. They'll feed into a common mechanical space, which will be addressed later, and then distributed to the two restaurants. Um, and uh, how will stormwater um, drainage be uh, managed on site? This is sheet 1502. Uh, stormwater basically flows on site from the south corner to the north corner on both sides. It's then collected via catch basins, pipes distributed, carried on site to an underground detention basin, which has been designed to meet, to meet the DEP reduction requirements. So, I have a question. So, 
So who's going to, who's the design engineer who's going to certify, uh, per Mr. Carley's report, that they've inspected the stormwater management system on the site, and he puts in bold from, for a specific reason, from the point of connection to the downstream structure, and that such system is in adequate repair and possesses sufficient capacity. Can you just note um, what you're reading from? Mr. Carley's report of June 14th, page three, you're talking about stormwater management, so it's 5.2. So I spoke with Mr. Carley regarding that comment. Um, it's mainly focused on the few structures that are to remain under this application. The system itself is proposed to be almost entirely new. There's one or two catch basins in the east corner that stay where we're making the tie-in. So the condition of those will be reviewed during construction, but everything within the site is new for the most part. So somebody's going to certify, as he suggested, that we ask that your design engineer has characterized and inspected a stormwater management system on the site, correct? I think the clarification is that this seems to speak to an existing site, the right. existing system on site. Um, as if it was being maintained, if we were using the old site, that it's adequate. Right. We're replacing it. What they've indicated is those few items, the basin, the few catch basins that will remain, they will uh, provide whatever certification is required, but the rest of the site is not an existing site. It's a new site being installed. Right, but it, it's unlike Mr. Carley not to know that on this June 14th letter, which is only three days ago. So it's not, did something change? No. Then why would he make a comment like that if it is all new? Because as to those few items that are going to remain, they will provide the certification. The rest okay. of the system is new. Fine. And uh, while we're in that section, the other items, the first one, 5.1, is merely a confirmation of information. And as to the um, 5.3 and 5.4, which are just asking for additional documentations, those will be provided. Um, and. Um, uh, 5.4, 5.5 rather, whatever notation is required will be added to the plan. So we can sort of wrap up that section on, uh, on the letter. Um, is that you good? Well, I guess I have a question on utilities. Mr. Carley says uh, he expects the closed circuit video inspection should be performed. I assume you have no problem with that. <clears throat> Item 6.3. Steve, you had a conversation with regard to that? Right. I spoke to Mr. Carley about that. He's focused on the sanitary sewer connection. So what's happening there, there's an existing line that comes into the macaroni grill building. Right. We're proposing to basically tap into that line right after the property line. So there's about a 20-foot stretch of pipe that goes out to the existing main that we're connecting to. So he wants that line video inspected, which the applicant's not opposed to. Good. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair. I just, want, I just want to ask, uh, to, I guess, to the attorney, all the underground uh, detention, water quality, whatever you want to call it, on site, that's all brand new, right? That, that wasn't existing, right? That's correct. Correct. There's no existing stormwater management right. outside of pipes and catch basins, so there's no reduction and there's no quality going on right now. Right. This application proposes to address the quantity in order to meet the DEP requirement. Okay. Thank you. Um, Steve, can you address uh, landscaping, what we're proposing to provide on site? Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Peasy. Before you go into sure. that, I just want to hit the stormwater. One more, one more question. It's, not, it's going to be a detention system where it's not going into a stormwater sewer. It's just merely going to uh, uh, dissipate and seep into the, gr into the ground. It ultimately will connect to the system. What, what's going to happen is it's going to get collected throughout the site, all carry over to this underground basin, the pipe galley. Yeah. Those are sealed. They're not infiltration pipes. What happens is there's an outlet control structure, um, which throttles back the flow out of the site to meet the reduction requirements. And then it then connects to where it was previously connecting to the municipal system. And then it'll leave the site that way. Okay. You can describe now what we're proposing in terms of landscaping. Landscaping. The landscaping plan is sheet CS 2001. Um, 
There's three main tree categories, uh, frontage trees, shade trees, and replacement trees. A calculation for shade tree and shade tree is based on the property frontage, which in this case is about 1,200 square, 1,200 linear feet. It works out to 24 trees for both of those. In order to meet the frontage trees, there's 18 that are remaining, mostly along Route 1 and Lafayette. In instances on the plan, they're grayed. Uh, we're proposing to add six trees to that along the parsonage frontage in order to meet the requirement for 24. Uh, similar nature is the shade trees. So within the site, there's 24 proposed shade trees. For the replacement trees, the applicant's proposing to provide payment for 15 of those, which is based on the number of trees that are coming down in order to accommodate this um, in line with the ordinance. In addition to the trees, there's some shrub plantings along the frontages, all 36 inches high to shield the lights from the various roadways. And along the front of the building, there's some smaller shrubs that kind of spruce up the building. Um, with all this, there's an irrigation system that will be installed to take care of that. Um, one of the comments under um, the engineer's um, review, um, he asked the question about um, snow stockpile. Um, have you identified um, where we would be able to locate um, snow um, after it was plowed on the site? And do you think it's an adequate area to accommodate? So snow removal, there's ample space on the end islands within the parking area, uh, specifically the west side. There's two tree collections here that snow can be stored on. There's a larger island within the west side of the parking lot that snow can be stored on. And then along the east side, the, the outer perimeter can accommodate snow. Okay. Um, we are proposing um, a new freestanding sign. Can you identify where that sign is proposed to be? And also just note for the board where the existing freestanding free standing sign is located on the site and the distance between them, if you would. I will start with the proposed sign that is located along the Route 1 frontage, uh, the west, west end, I will say. Um, it meets the setback, of, setback requirement of 15 feet which is right here, it's located, it's going to be located within a planter area, which means it could be close to the ground according to the ordinance. And there's some ground level plantings that shield the bottom of that. The existing sign is on the east side, also along the Route 1 frontage, but closer to the Parsonage Route 1 intersection here. Yes, Mr. Bignell. Yeah, I just want to point out the the larger sign on the on the corner, that's the mall sign, Menlo Park Mall. The yellow sign would be for the restaurant. So I don't, I believe they're both permitted signs. So. Thank you. Um, okay, um, and now if you could um, identify what kind of lighting is proposed for the facility. So as part of this application, all the existing site lighting is going to be removed. Uh, the proposed lighting, it's a combination of 25-foot tall poles in the parking area and then 10-foot high poles along some of the pedestrian circulation areas. Um, the lighting foot candle level is in compliance with the code. I think Mr. Bignell mentioned that in his review letter. Um, there's also a note on the plans about reducing the lighting level in the parking lot. After both restaurants close, within an hour, the lighting level will drop down to one foot candle within the parking area so that you don't have the glare effect near the highway there. Um, and I would note um, for the record that item 4.1 of the engineer's re review letter does acknowledge that um, the proposed lighting will comply with the ordinance consistent with Mr. Bignell's uh, review.
there's other um, signage. The building signage will be handled by the architect. Um, uh, just to, to clarify, in case we didn't say it, although we will describe it further, the building is oriented. Where is the front of the building facing? So the main entrances to the building are along Route 1, although three sides are technically the frontage. The main doors are along the southwest and southeast corners for each restaurant. Uh, the division is pretty much in the middle of the two and with the entrances here and here. Okay. Uh, that's all we have for direct for our uh, uh, civil engineer subject to our right to recall. Madam Chair. Mr. Bignell? Yeah, can we just, do you agree to all the comments in my report, a, uh, June 4th? When you say the comments, you are referring to the 11. review comments, item 11? Yes. Um, um, we need to provide, provide, provide a little more testimony on, on, on G on that one. We were going to ask for some clarification since we don't see any standards for that. Um, the, um, the responsibility for the landscape maintenance that you inquired about item E is um, Shopping Center Associates, um, who is the, uh, the owner both of this parcel and also of the Menlo Park Mall. Um, so that that's, was actually, I think, a, a question. Um, my, my and, is 14. Um, or we, are, we know we are subject and acknowledge that we're subject to the Edison Township Property Maintenance Code, but we do not know of, um, haven't identified any standard for um, a site maintenance plan. So if we could come back to that when we get through the testimony. Well, I would just like some kind of language in the resolution that says we're going to you know, cut the grass and make it look nice on a regular basis in the uh, growing season. I mean, for some reason, they forget to cut the grass out there. It looks like heck. Is the, I guess the question, is that different than what the code requires? Well, the code requires you, you maintain the property. So you just, you, I guess the testimony, you, you're going to be in compliance, and we have another avenue to come get you if you don't take care of the property. That's all. Just because it's out there on a highway, it, it needs to be maintained. It needs to be, um, you know, trimmed at whatever. And this property itself has been let go because there's no tenants. I mean, somebody has to maintain these properties even if they're vacant. Okay? So that's where I'm going with this. We, we, if we can come back to that, we'll discuss it with the client. And Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. And then what about the... Uh, the, the height of the shrubs around the parking area, the 36 inches, that's okay? Time of planting? I think, it, Steve, that's yeah, what we're we, proposing. Yeah, we were okay with that. Okay. okay. Proposed and I know your plan indicates the irrigation system? Yes. yes. Correct. Okay. Thank yes. you, Madam Chair. Okay. Yes. Madam Chair, are they also going to comply with all the remaining requirements of the engineer's report? Um, I don't know that there are any we can run through. Um, we would like to discuss 2.6 with the board. Um, and I think other than that, at least from my notes, I think we have agreed to um, to all of the other items. Um, oh, I will say that we do have a question. Um, Steve, I think we're done with your direct. If you want, let's go through these. The come sit down, and we can go through the other. Um, yeah, Mr. One, one question. Mr. Bignell, you, you note a uh, violation of signage on page three of your report, I believe. I don't believe it's been addressed. Is that true? We have a violation on signage? It's not a it's a, we, we have a variance request, um, and that will be addressed by our architect and our planner. That's, it just wasn't within the uh, engineer's area. Yes, we're asking for a, a fourth sign, or a sign on the fourth wall, I guess I should say, the fourth um, wall. We're entitled to three, and we're asking for a fourth one on a wall that is not a frontage wall. Facade sign. A facade sign, sorry. You're allowed to have a, a, a facade sign on every front of your property. This property is unique because it has three front sides. And so the ones they, they're asking for four because that's, and that, that would require the variance. So they're going to provide testimony. That's what the planner is going to do. We requested the, identified that. <coughs> so we'll come back to that. <coughs> I think the driving point for the board is for consultants. Uh, you know, are there any exceptions in those reports 
with the yes. one question that you have on there, because we'll be looking for your compliance on all of them. If you agree to that, would you say you have one and that we're going to address that one? Is that correct? All uh, the others have been accepted. No, I said that we have we um, have a question with regard to the sidewalk. The others. Um, which, which, you're back to the engineering report, correct? Yes, I'm sorry. So, we are. So before we leave Hank's report, so we have an open item on E. Yes. I, I have some concerns about that. But we want you to maintain it, whatever it takes. So that's we want to come back to that, right? And then, yes. So, so now we're going to go back to the engineering report. That's correct. And you're on 2.6. Um, yes. And the sign. The question with 2.6 has to do with sidewalks. Um, Parsonage Road is a county road. Lafayette is a county road. Route 1 is a state highway. So we believe jurisdiction with regard to sidewalk is with other jurisdictions. Um, and that's why we've noted that um, the comment um, with regard to sidewalks. We don't believe that, that the municipal ordinance um, takes precedence because of the other jurisdictions having control. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to our lawyers and our consultants. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. I'll defer to our lawyers and consultants if you would like to sign. That's why we said we would hold these so we can get through our direct testimony. We were just trying to cover as many of the comments within the, uh, the engineer's testimony. Um, and I think all the other items on page two have been covered. Stormwater, I think we agreed to or discussed those. Similarly, with utilities, um, Steve, item 6.4 in the engineer's letter. 6.4, I spoke to Mr. Carley about. Um, he's looking for uh, water demand based on the number of seats, which you would do typically through an NJDEP application if you exceeded 8,000 gallons per day, 12,000 gallons per day. Yeah, this see. one does not. So he's just simply asked for a memo explaining how many seats there are and the anticipated water demand. He also wants the will serve response from Middlesex Water, which we'll provide. Okay, so 6.4 will comply with. Um, I think the 6.5 is the fire suppression is probably an architect uh, um, issue. Um, and uh, the will serve 6.6, .6, if those have any that aren't, haven't already been submitted, will be submitted. Um, 7.1, um, can you address, Steve, the, um, the, what we have proposed? You've identified the location of the recycling and refuse uh, container area. Can you um, I, respond to how we calculated what, why we believe that the uh, facility that we've designed is adequate to accommodate the, um, these proposed restaurants? So right now, the Dumpster enclosure area, again, is at the northeast side. Uh, there's two 10 cubic yard dumpsters there. One's garbage, one's recycling. It's my understanding from the applicant that, that those will be emptied as they're filled. Uh, the expectation for that's typically once a week. It'll depend how busy the restaurant is, but those are typical size dumpsters for restaurant application. And we will control, or the operator will control the frequency of pickup uh, if it proves necessary to do it more frequently based on volume, we will have control over that. It's private? Correct. It's privately contracted, so if, if it needs to be picked up, they just need to call. Um, and with regard to 7.2, this is another item that we thought we would, um, we might want to discuss. Um, we don't read the ordinance. Um, this indicates that the trash enclosure um, is, um, too close to a public right-of-way. We have read that section, and um, Steve may be prepared to deal with it. Our planner may also. Uh, that does not refer to trash enclosures. It appears to um, materials. So we, we did not think that the that section related to the location of a refuse container as opposed to outdoor storage or sales. Um, so we thought we could hold that and come back to, to discuss it. Does um, DNR agree with that? Uh, we do not. Uh, it's our interpretation of the ordinance that the, the trash and recycling container should be more than 50 feet from a public street. I don't like to contradict the engineers. The only problem is they have three frontages, and it's almost impossible to find a spot, you know, unless it's in the middle of the parking lot where it would fit. So I, I don't have any problem with it. And if it's screened properly. Sort of why we were going to leave it to. 
And they did close the driveway on that side of the property so they can provide the screening and so. Hmm. But the, the screening, I, I don't have an up-to-date drawing. I've got, I'm not sure what I'm looking at here, but just uh, it says a, a block retaining wall, dumpster enclosure. How high is that block retaining wall and dumpster enclosure? So the architect will confirm the height. Um, there's a wall there that encloses it, and in front of the wall there's numerous plantings that kind of screen the wall. Uh, it will be higher than the dumpster, so nobody can really see in. The intent was to screen both the dumpsters and the, any loading operations. Um, the items under 8, environmental, um, 8.1, 8.2, and 8.3 are just statements. Um, will we provide the information in 8.4 with regard to cut and fill? We will. And will we comply with uh, the items under miscellaneous, uh, the items to be covered in connection with the pre-construction meeting if approval is granted? Yes. Um, the last 9.2 is an as-built survey, and the rest are just outside agency approvals, which will be pursued. Obviously, we have no problems with whatever approvals are required will be pursued. Unless there's other. I don't see any other questions. Your next witness, then? Thank you, Steve. Our next oh, witness. I'm sorry. Whoops. I'm missing the agenda. Okay. Yeah, yes. we just were missing a page, but we're okay. Oh, of a report? Is it? Oh. Um, okay. The next witness we would call is our architect. Uh, last name is spelled P A N. Sorry, this one's not working then. Um. You talk right into a wall. Okay, I'll, I'll use this one. Can you hear me now? This is no. Uh, the light's on. Try it now. Put it at 90 degrees. Unless you have a loud mouth like me, you mean? Can you hear me? Now? No? Can you bring it a little bit closer to your Okay. Uh, my name is Walter Pensevich. Uh, last name is spelled P A N C E W I C Z. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll scream. How about yours? Implying that they don't even need that to hear me. <laughs> All right, is this one working? Okay, I, I am talking, right? I know you are talking. <laughs> I'm talking. <laughs> All right, I will project. Is it? Is it? Is it we need to be able to record this. We can't really proceed if we're not recording. That will not be good. Not hearing any tapping. I also have a loud voice. You and I can just carry on. <laughs> Um, let's start again. Just spell your name for the board okay. and um, please advise them with whom you're associated, your educational and professional background and licenses you hold. Okay. Uh, my uh, name is Walter Pensevich. My last name is spelled P-A-N-C-E-W-I-C-Z. -E I am with ARIA Group Architects, Inc., uh, the architect for the Shell building for the property. I, I am an, a graduate of IIT, Illinois Institute of Technology, in 1982. 
I have been practicing uh, as an architect, a licensed architect for 30 years, and 25 of those years are with Aria Group Architects as a principal. Uh, I have a degree from my university, a uh, Bachelor of Architecture, uh, Ar Bachelor of Architect degree. All right, and um, do you hold licenses in your field, and is one of those licenses in the state of New Jersey? Yes, I do. I originally got my first license in Illinois. I am licensed in New Jersey and 10 other states. And we have another novice for you, only in New Jersey. Um, I, I, am I correct that you have not testified before a board in New Jersey? Correct. Nevertheless, with his license and years of experience, we would ask that the board accept him as an expert in the field of architecture. And we shall accept you as an expert in your field. Thank you. Thank you. We're breaking them in tonight. Um, <laughs> all right. Can you also advise the board what plan they should be looking at the most recent date on the plans that are before them? Right. Uh, you'll be looking at the uh, drawings and plans that are dated May 17th, 2019. Um, and can you please walk us through a description of what's being proposed in terms of the size of the building overall and the components of the building, meaning the... Madam Chair, just yes. so you know, uh, our, our drawings are sealed and dated March 14, 2019. Yeah, the ones we were just looking at also. So there's a, there's a more recent drawing that you have? Um, the architectural plans were submitted under cover date of May 22, 2019, with revision date May 17, 2019. Mr. Bignell, do you have the correct plans or? Mine are revised from May 17th. Right, that's what yeah. ours should be. How about our uh, other? Right. Frank, Frank is here. Frank? You have the 17th? Yeah. Well, well, we can, we'll you wait to clarify. Is it on all sheets? Yeah. Yeah. Has there, has there been any major changes? That's what we were just... Yeah. The, well, the, the changes were just clarification on the signage and some dimensions. Oh. At the TRC that we had been asked to, it, um, to add some additional dimensions. The building did not change, but we were asked for clarification uh, with regard to the signage and with some of the dimensions on the building. But the building itself, nothing had been changed. But we are comfortable from our consultants. They have reviewed the latest set of drawings and all the comments pertain to the latest and most accurate set of drawings. Yes, everything in our report is based on the May 17th. Mr. Bignell? Yeah, that's ours too. Okay. Okay. Well, why don't we just walk through if we, we can sure. show you, if we can distribute a plan if there's anything you need to look at more closely, but why don't you walk us through um, the, um, the size of the building and within that building how the space is distributed between the two restaurants and then some of the uh, external seating um, characteristics that make the project unique. Okay. Uh, the, the new building that's replacing the macaroni grill is uh, approximately 12,285 uh, square feet. Uh, it is split between two uh, future tenants, uh, Shake Shack, which will be roughly 3,500 square, 60 square feet, and True Food Kitchen, which is 6,400. That being said, True Food also has 1,370 square feet of patio on two sides, on the south side and on the north side. And uh, Shake Shack will have a 790 square foot patio, and that's only on the south side. Uh, both, build, uh, both tenants will be divided by a common wall down, almost down the middle, uh, and it is a steel structure, one-story building. Uh, there is common uh, elements in the back. Uh, the electrical and sprinkler room will be shared by both tenants, the shared service yard as well, and then there's a mechanical room and hot water heater room that will also be shared by both tenants. 
what you described um, as the, the patio, these have uh, roofs on them? These are uh, seating correct. areas, is that correct? Yeah, they're seating dining areas. Uh, they have coverage. Uh, they're open on all sides except the top. There's a, there's a full coverage uh, patio for uh, rain and sun uh, coverage. And those areas, uh, to your knowledge, those were included in the area of the building when we did things like calculate for parking? Correct. And uh, the dimensions. For, for parking and for toilet counts and everything. Okay. Um, and can you, now I, I do have one set if you want me to, this is the May 17, if this, if it would want me to just pass it to the board if there's, uh, for the exterior, would that be helpful? I can give and this is too. dated May 17. Why don't I start one at each end? So while I'm distributing this, could you describe Can we mark that, those as A2, please? It's two sheets. So A2 would be two sheets with the um, elevation, colored elevation, which was part of the, um, the set that was submitted. Could you describe um, the um, the exterior in terms of the colors, uh, the different roof levels, um, and the um, the proposed materials that will be used for the um, for the exterior? Yes. Uh, so the first thing we did was try to modulate the two uh, the two tenants building. It's one building, but trying to make it look like two different buildings by modulating the heights and the in and outs of all the facades uh, to give it a little bit more three dimensionality. Uh, the roof, there's only one roof there, but we've created different parapet heights that give you the feeling of different roof heights and everything. Uh, finishes are, are tended to be browns, grays, yellows, and beiges, uh, all warm colors. Even the gray is a very warm gray. Uh, and it uh, speaks to their branding, uh, their, their brand colors, and their brand uh, materials. Uh, we have on, on uh, True Food Kitchen, we do have some stucco and standing seam uh, uh, facing, as well as uh, wood grain porcelain uh, tiles. And then on the Shake Shack side, we also have standing room, stucco, and some steel uh, paneling and uh, cement fiberboard. <coughs> yes. Uh, we have brought a material board, if we could mark. There are two of them. Before we go up, let me just borrow that. Um, the one that I'm looking at is um, for a true food kitchen. Am I allowed to put a light on it? So that right, I'm just going to put Mark that as A3. So A3 is the um, material board for a true food kitchen. And then A4. Is the material board for Shake Shack? Okay. Why don't you, you describe the colors? Are you? Um, can you just go through now before you hand them to them? Just tell us what these various materials, what part of the building each one of those will be used for, and then we can distribute those. Okay. So this is uh, the uh, True Food Kitchen uh, color wow. board. Speak up. Sorry. Yeah. Bless the mic. Sorry. Yeah. This is the uh, True Food Kitchen color board. Uh, on the, as I point to the different finishes, this one here is the wood grain porcelain tile. All these materials are very durable and withstand a lot of uh, distress. Uh, so that's the porcelain uh, wood grain tile. Then we have uh, this material below is a gray material that will be the standing seam portion of the uh, facade. This here is the EFIS stucco portion. This one here is the aluminum entry doors. The, they have a yellow uh, awnings over some of the windows. And then we have a wood grain, uh, the beams and the, pa uh, the beams for the canopy cover of the patio is wood grained. It's a wood piece matching this grain here. And then the storefront panels are a black anodized uh, glazing with low E glass. Pass that while you describe the one for Shake Shack. The one for Shake Shack, a few less materials. Uh, their uh, patio canopy is also a wood grain wood structure uh, surrounded by steel. They have a, the exterior wall, they have a black uh, 
a grayish stucco, and then they have a cement fiber board, and then they also have exterior uh, metal pa anodized panels, and their storefront is an anodized black also. All right. Um, while we're passing this, if you could then describe the facade signs that are proposed for each of the two restaurants at the building. Okay. Starting with uh, Shake Shack, uh, Shake Shack has uh, multiple signs on the three frontage sides that they face. Um, it's very unique that they, uh, we have three streets that uh, surround uh, the building. On the south side, we have a uh, signage that is 21 feet long by 22 foot 6 high for a total of uh, 177 square feet, which we are allowed to have 247. But that is combined with the, uh, the True Food Kitchen sign, which is also uh, part of that calculation of 177 on the uh, Route 1 side. On the Parsonage side, Shake Shack has one sign that is a total of 175 square feet, and we're allowed 210 square feet. On the Lafayette side, there is uh, signs both for True Food and for Shake Shack. Uh, totaling 80 square feet, and we're allowed 243 uh, square feet. And then on the, should I go on to the fourth side? Mm -hmm. And then on the fourth side is the, the side facing no street, is the sign we are asking for a variance. That sign is 85 square feet, and we would be allowed 197 square feet. And when I say we're allowed, it's based on the percentage of the facade of the building, of that side. Okay. So it's a percentage of that. So we would be allowed 197 if there was a street there. Since there's not, we're asking for a variance. O overall, we're under, uh, when you add up all the signs, we are under the percentages allowed. Okay. And um, could you describe the, um, um, with regard to the signs, um, uh, where, uh, if you can describe it in relation to, I'll call it the lower roof. Yes. Um, or the roof on one of the exterior eating areas. Right. Uh, based on their branding, uh, the way they, they do their designs, they like their, their signs forward of the canopy of the patio. So it's not mounted on, uh, so three of the signs, four of the signs, uh, including the one we're asking for a variance, they would be mounted on the edge of the patio roof, which is the patio cover. Uh, and it's uh, away from the building. And does it also um, extend beyond the, um, the end of the um, canopy or the roof, um, uh, not just the depth away from the wall, but beyond the, the lower roof? Does it exceed beyond that? No, it does not. Okay, so it comes up to the edge right, of the roof. Right, to the, the edge of the roof. Okay. Um, and um, are, is there any lighting or anything else unique about the signs, the right. color of them, or what? It, uh, all the signs are uh, uh, channel letters uh, internally lit with a uh, frosted uh, glass cover or plexi, plexi cover. Uh, the only other signage that is there, um, there is pin-mounted channel letters just painted on the edge of the canopy of Shake Shack. So that, that's where it says, you know, shakes, burgers, and all that's what, those are non-lit uh, white channel letters pin mounted to the face of the canopy. Okay. And can you, I know Steve described the location and dimension of the monument sign that's being proposed on the Route 1 side, um, the one that does deal with the, the restaurant uses. Could you just describe what's proposed on that? And I don't recall if Steve gave the dimension on it. Uh, it is a, uh, it's going to be a, a aluminum box sign with uh, with the vinyl uh, applied letters. It is four foot six high, I believe. I think maybe you guys have that drawing. I think I may have given that one out. Okay. Instead of this one. Oh, okay. But the, uh, but, he has it. Oh, yeah, yeah, here we go. Uh, it is, is this? so it is five foot five high, four feet wide, eight, eight and a half inches uh, thick. It is aluminum sign cabinet with applied graphics for True Food Kitchen and for Shake Shack. And the reveal at the bottom, there's a reveal at the bottom that it sits on is painted black. Um, you do, I mean, the plan set did include um, the, the floor plans. They are as shown on the plan. We can walk through them if you'd like or we'll rely on the, uh, the plan to depict the layout of the interior. 
think that's all we have for direct testimony with, uh, from the architect. And I think the only, I think we discussed the comments in Mr. Bignell's letter had to do with the signage um, and his identification of the one as to which a variance was required. So the only sign variance you need is for one sign on a wall not facing a street? The um, only sign variance you need is for a one wall sign not facing the street? Not facing the street. Also, uh, a variance also for the, um, the signs mounted at the edge of the canopy as opposed to on the wall of the building. Right. We identified that also. We're not quite sure it comes within the contemplation, but we did, um, we did identify um, a variance for the sign being further than 18 inches from the wall. Um, and you know, I think we're in agreement. Well, we may have identified it. The, um, the two monument signs, because we're beyond 300 feet, we're advised that's how it's interpreted. So no variance is what, no variance rather was required. Um, for that. Um, I think that was, those were the ones um, that we, oh, the um, signage not being permitted above the roof line because there was a lower roof and an upper roof. We also identified that in case it's interpreted to require a variance because the signs sit above the lower roof, below the upper roof. And we noticed that in case that was interpreted to require another deviation for variance. And that's what we have for the architect. Mr. Bignell, do you have any comments on the signage issues that were discussed here? Yeah, uh, the reason why I pointed out the sign before is that the GBH zone allows them to have their monument sign, which is fine. And the other sign, that it, it, it seems to be on their property, but it's also... It could be linked to the to a regional sign for the um, for the mall itself, which has a different set of standards. So I, I don't want to confuse the both, but they're separated far enough to allow the two signs. One doesn't have anything to do with the with the um, with the with the uh, restaurants. It has to do with the advertise the mall. So I don't think there's a problem with either one. I don't think there's a variant situation. It's just for that fourth uh, facade sign. Okay. Thank you. Have our planner, Thank unless the, I didn't do we, the public. Would you do that after questions for the witness? Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you should wait till. Yeah. Okay, that's all. Then we're ready to go to our planner. <clears throat> you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, I do. Uh, please state your name and spell it for the record. My name is Keenan Hughes, H U G H E S. Keenan, could you please tell the board with whom you're associated, uh, any licenses that you hold, your educational background, and if you've appeared before other boards in the state of New Jersey, and have you been accepted as an expert in the field of planning? Yes, uh, I'm a principal of Phillips Price, a planning firm based in Hoboken. I'm a licensed professional planner in the state, a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, um, and I've appeared before numerous boards throughout the state, including the Edison Planning Board and the Edison Zoning Board. And we will accept you as an expert in your field. Thank, Thank you. you. for accepting him as an expert in the field of planning. Uh, Keenan, can you just briefly go through what you did to prepare for the hearing and then uh, briefly go through what we're proposing and the variances that we require? Sure. Uh, I reviewed the application, obviously. Also visited the site and the surrounding area. I reviewed the township's master plan and its zoning ordinance and also reviewed the letters from the board professionals. Um, in terms of the overall proposal, I think it's been well described by the preceding witnesses. Um, it's, this is obviously very much a commercial context along Route 1. And in my opinion, uh, the variance relief that's necessary for this project is, is quite minimal when you consider the overall um, project itself. And it really is tied to the fact that there's multiple, in fact, three uh, street frontages um, on this site. So that dictates um, much of the re relief that we're seeking this evening. Um, and the variances um, include uh, the building setback from Lafayette Avenue. Um, again, because 50 feet is required along each of the street frontages, um, there's a setback to actually the patio area of the building at 11.65 feet. Um, the parking setback um, from Lafayette 
um, which is um, five feet being required and down to about 4.1 feet at a certain point, um, and then the relief for the signs, which was just discussed. So um, I'll walk through each of the variances. They're all C variances, of course. We're here before the planning board. Each of these variances can be justified on a C2 basis in that the purposes of zoning are advanced and the benefits of deviating from the ordinance uh, requirements outweigh any detriments. And then we'll also address the negative criteria um, in that the variance can be granted without substantial impairment to the public good or, and without substantially impairing the purpose and intent of the master plan and zoning ordinance. So with that context, I'll start with the, the variance along Lafayette, uh, which is the 11.65 foot um, setback. And um, I do want to point out again that this is essentially an existing condition in that the existing macaroni grill building had the same um, essential orientation, three frontages. Um, so this setback here is 11.65 feet. Um, again, because there are three front yards, um, it, it is practically difficult to accommodate 50 feet setback along each of those frontages. Um, and this is really integral to facilitating the overall development of the site for freestanding commercial use. Um, I would also point out from a zoning standpoint, um, for a commercial use such as this, especially when it is adjacent to other commercial uses, it's common that the rear yard is actually less than the front yard setback. And in this situation, this is really functioning as a rear yard um, to this facility. So um, with that in mind, I think it's an appropriate setback um, from an aesthetic standpoint, also from a functional standpoint. Um, and it, the grant of this variance would further purposes A and G of the municipal land use law in terms of um, being integral to really allowing for this um, development to take place, what is a, a very appropriate use for the site. Um, and then in terms of uh, the second prong of the negative, or excuse me, the um, negative criteria, there's no substantial detriment to the public good. And in terms of the impairment to the master plan and the zoning ordinance, I would say that it's unlikely that uh, the drafters of the ordinance really contemplated uh, a site which would have three front yards um, as this does. And as I pointed out, from a planning perspective, the proposed setback is, is quite appropriate for this use. Um, secondly is the setback of the parking area to less than five feet along Lafayette. Um, and this is really insignificant in my opinion. Um, it's just over four feet at a certain point. Um, this is uh, similar to the prior variance I discussed, is, is basically an existing condition. The curb line here is not gonna change. Um, and in the existing condition, the parking is, is roughly in the same um, orientation and location along Lafayette. Um, so this one would also further purposes A and G, again, because it's important to allowing for the overall development and to provide adequate parking and circulation on site to support the use. Um, so in terms of the negative criteria, no substantial detriments to the public good, this being an existing condition, we have no evidence of this setback creating any uh, problems or negative impacts um, based on the prior use of the site. And it would also not substantially impair the intent and purpose of the master plan and zoning ordinance. Again, this being a unique situation with three front yards. Um, finally, I'll just address the signage, um, which in my opinion is, is really quite attractive for this site. Um, I think the architecture is really <coughs> high quality for this type of freestanding um, retail use. Um, but we do, because um, we have essentially four frontages here in terms of the visibility of the building, we are proposing a sign that is oriented um, to the west, um, which would be facing internally to the parking area, um, facing the McDonald's located to the south or to the west of the site. And uh, this sign I would point out at 85 square feet, it's actually less than what would be permitted um, if this was a, a, a street facing facade. So in terms of the overall size of the sign, I think it's, a, it's appropriate. Um, it also signifies the entrance to the building uh, at the True Food Kitchen entrance. So architecturally, I think it works well from an aesthetic standpoint, and then it also, from a functional standpoint, has a, a clear purpose in terms of identifying that entrance. Um, so that one would further purposes A and I of the municipal land use law, um, promoting a desirable visual environment, and also just facilitating 
um, the overall retail development of the site. Um, it would not cause any substantial detriments to the public good or substantially impair the master plan um, and zoning ordinance. Um, again, because of the fact that this is really a unique situation with four frontages. Um, and then finally, in my opinion, I think we've um, identif conservatively identified a variance for the mounting of the signs um, in a, a roof location. Um, in my experience, that type of requirement is really to prohibit you know, uh, roof-mounted projecting signage that you might see from Route 1 really projecting above the roof illuminated. That's not the case here. This is a, really a canopy-mounted sign. It's something that you're seeing um, it, more common in retail facilities. They're quite attractive. Um, and again, um, on each facade, we're well below the maximum sign area that's actually permitted. So in terms of the overall proposal, I think it's really quite attractive and well-designed. Uh, promotes purposes A and I of the Missile Land Use Law, and we can also satisfy the negative criteria in terms of showing no substantial detriment to the public good or any impairment of the master plan and zoning ordinance. Uh, where the sign is on the lower roof, when you are facing it and looking at the sign, looking through it, it has the appearance of a facade sign, notwithstanding that it sits forward somewhat. So um, it, in that regard, it would not... Um, um, be contrary to the location in terms of its the 18-inch limitation on, on the, um, the location of the facade sign. Is that I right? agree, yes. I agree with that. Um, the, the last item I think that we need to discuss was the engineer's call out of the location of the dumpster. Um, have you had occasion to take a look at the ordinance provision? Um, and I'm not certain if that would, was identified as a variance or a waiver. Um, when they called it out, just since they said that it didn't comply. But um, can you address, uh, did you review the ordinance and was your understanding that the ordinance addressed um, this type of situation, the dumpster? I did review the ordinance. My interpretation was um, it's, it's a pretty common requirement in commercial and industrial areas to prohibit outdoor storage. Um, in some cases, outright prohibit outdoor storage of goods and equipment and that sort of thing. In this case, um, I, I felt it was trying to address exactly that situation. It was um, providing a setback um, for the storage areas. This is a trash enclosure, one that you would find on any retail facility um, in Edison. And to the extent a variance would be required, I would just say if you, if you really look at the site plan, this is really the most appropriate location for the trash enclosure on site. Um, this is really tied to the fact that there's multiple street frontages here, three street frontages, um, and so it's not possible to achieve a full 50-foot setback for that trash enclosure. But the important point is that it's adequately screened with the six-foot wall. Um, it's not going to be you know, exposed trash or visible from the public right-of-way, so it's really integrated within the design of the building. Um, so to the extent a variance is needed or a, a, and a design waiver, um, the applicant could, could satisfy those criteria. No negative impact, um, no, uh, no impact on any surrounding uses given that's, its location. That's history. correct. No substantial detriments to the public good or impairment of the, the zone plan. That would be the, um, our direct testimony subject to our right to recall. And to the extent we need to move our exhibits into the record, we would ask to do so. Yeah, I think then at this point we'll open to the public. Well, just a minute, well, Madam oh, Chair. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mr. Daniel? This, uh, comment by Mr. Big now, unless I missed it, about your client in the back said, well, we'll talk about it. This is the. It's working, sorry. This addresses the issue that Mr. Big now, con at least I'm concerned about who's going to take care of the, the mowing of the lawn and whatever on Route 1. You kind of suggested you don't have to. No, I don't think that's what we said. What we said was we will comply with the property maintenance ordinance. The question here was there was a request that we put together a specific property maintenance plan. Right. And all we had said was we're not aware of what the standard of that is. I'm not trying to create a situation for the client that there is some standard that they would be in violation of separate from the property maintenance ordinance, which we've acknowledged we're subject to. That was what we had said. And Madam Chair, for you. Um, the reason why I put it in this report is because when we did the the seasons 85, 
I was told the same thing about the sign, and it hasn't been being maintained. And I, I discussed it at TRC, and I want, I want, I want to know that you're going to cut the grass once a week, twice a week. I want it on the record that how we're going to maintain that sign. It's up on the highway. So I mean, I've been asking for it. It's not a new thing. It shouldn't be a surprise. Um, you told me back when he did the other restaurant that it was going to be taken care of. I just want to find out how we're going to do that, and that's all. Mr. Pignell, is this the same owner of Seasons? Oh, it's, well, it's the same property. I don't know who owns what out there, you know. Same property. Simon. So. We will represent that we are responsible for the site, that, that the uh, landscaping at the sign as owner of the property. The applicant this evening is the owner of the property. Right. And the maintenance. So that's what we said, the maintenance of the yeah. landscaping. I think that's what Mr. Bignell is talking about, the landscaping at the base of the monument mall sign. Yeah, I want something on the record so that when the next time you come and you're not doing it, I'm going to remind you again because, you know. It, there is it also is a note added to the plan. It okay. Is plan, that the um, applicant agrees to maintain the property in accordance with the property maintenance code of the township that's listed on the plan right, set. But, but Mr. Bignell is saying something more than that. That's my impression. Well, I, I don't spend an hour doing this. It's getting kind of silly, but I, no, I but want them to maintain the property. I think it's, it's fair that we ask them to maintain the, the, the front side of the property on Route 1. That's all. And we've agreed to do that. Okay. So that's, I'm, I'm satisfied with that, Madam Chair. I think he's talking about the mall sign. Mall sign. Yeah. You represent we Simon. Okay, fine. We're well, responsible for Route 1 and Parsonage Road, where you have that little monument there, and then I guess I think that's where you want That's it, what we're talking right? about. Okay. I mean, I mean, you would think that you would want that, because that's representative not, of your entire mall. But it's not Absolutely, being done. and we're not arguing. Right. All we're okay. saying is to start putting in additional standards that then we have another layer beyond what everybody's responsible under the property maintenance, we've agreed on the record to maintain okay. the landscaping at the base of the zone. Fine. Was there anything? Anyone else? Okay, am I safe then to open to the public? Oh, anyone, the anyone from the public, please come forward. Address. Having seen no one come forward, I make a motion we close public portion. Uh, before we, uh, I, I just want. All in favor? Aye. Okay. And the the only other thing we had left open, I think, unless I've missed something else, was the um, provision in the engineering letter with regard to the uh, sidewalk. That was the only other item that we had. Um, in the past, um, we have. I remember we did one on Woodbridge Avenue, which is a county road, where there was an issue of whether sidewalks needed to be put in or not, and they said it was county jurisdiction. And the resolution simply states that they will seek a waiver from the municipality, irrespective of who has jurisdiction. So, I don't, I, to me, that set a precedent that the board just says, we have no jurisdiction over sidewalks. Go to the town and see what the town says. Okay. I, I just, I would like clarification. Going to the town to see what the town says to me is different than going to the town to get a waiver. Our position is we don't need a waiver because the town doesn't have jurisdiction. And what we were saying is take it up with the town. If the, if the town agrees they don't have jurisdiction, so be it. If the town says you need a waiver, then it's up to the town whether they grant the waiver or not. But we don't have, we don't, we're not going to sit here and tell, speak on behalf of the town as to what jurisdiction the town has or doesn't have. Right. Like last time, right? You said, yeah. We said go to the town. Well, also our hands were tied for. Well, we, but the yeah. applicant's suggesting that our hands aren't tied because. Beyond the town has no jurisdiction right. over these ro over this this property because it, it fronts on county and state roads, and we're saying that's not, that's a call that we're not prepared to make. Let the town make that call. And that's that's what we did last time, and that's what I'll do again. Okay. Put it in the resolution. Right. The resolution will say that. Right. Madam Chair, I'd like yes, to ask Mr. Mr. Bignell, uh, Hank. Um, are you satisfied with the enclosure for the dumpster? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to get back to the sidewalk and finish where we're going with that. So last time we put in the resolution, right? Yes, we put in the resolution that they would seek a waiver from the town. If the town decides that no waiver is necessary because they have no jurisdiction, then the that's the town's determination. Fine. If the town determines that a waiver is necessary and they grant it, so that's fine. If they decide not to grant it, then that's between 
the applicant and the tenant. So, that's what we want. Excuse me? That's what we would like, like we did with the last applicant. We put our position on. The board will okay, make then, its yeah, determination. Yeah, I mean, our position is that yeah. so you're, other, so jurisdictions ha uh, other jurisdictions have jurisdiction. Okay, but so. so what you're saying, you don't want to do that. You don't, you don't want to put that you'll mm -hmm. seek a waiver from the town and they'll decide if they don't have jurisdiction or not, but you're taking it out of our hands. We want, we want the resolution to say you will seek a waiver. I think what if, we'd like it to say, at, at Max, is that we will go to the town for their determination, not saying we need a waiver because okay. that's not determined. Fine. That's fair. Yeah. I'm okay with that. But you, you, yeah. you, you, as part of the resolution, you will seek a waiver and, or ask the waiver, or you want to say it again? Determination. Determination as to right. jurisdiction will be left to the township. Fine. Right. I'm okay with that. Madam Chair, you have to open up to the public. We did, we did. We, and we closed public voice. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, make a motion to uh, grant uh, preliminary and final preliminary and final approval of this application, including the. Uh, requested variances for uh, front, uh, front yard setback of 11.65 feet versus the 50 feet required, which exists. Also the uh, less than five foot, actually four foot point one one feet uh, from the, for the parking lot setback. Uh, we will also grant the variance for the fourth facade sign and the canopy sign, which I believe is uh, less than 18 inches from more, 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 than, more than 18 inches from right. the canopy. Uh, as discussed, the uh, location of the uh, dumpster, as indicated in uh, Mr. Bignell's uh, uh, DNR's report, will be uh, we will uh, grant the location and approve the location of the dumpster with proper. Uh, uh, landscaping, thank you. Uh, and also uh, add the note that the applicant will maintain the mall sign on Route 1 and Parsonage Road under accepted conditions. And as outlined, we will put the indication for the variance if, if uh, granted or put that in the hand of uh, sidewalk variance in the hands of the uh, township as we have done previous uh, applications. Uh, with the following conditions, I believe, that have been testified to, with the, the exceptions of the ones we mentioned, the acceptance of all the recommendations from our consultants based on their latest review letters as it applies to the application. And finally, adding the proviso that on no changes can be made to these conditions of approval without returning to this board to seek our approval. Madam Chair? Yes. I'll second that motion. Okay. And, and just, just for clarity uh, of the, uh, the going to the township to see whether or not they have jurisdiction. Uh, that's, they're, they're going to ask the township whether they have jurisdiction on the uh, waivers. On the sidewalk. Sidewalks. Okay. Lillian? Yes for preliminary and final. Yes. Yes. Yes in the motion. Yes. 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 Thank you so much. Now I'm looking, the core reporter had asked me to have her break. Um, so, yes. So let me call for a five minute break while the core reporter gets ready for the next application. <laughs> Hopefully, we have everyone seated. Um, I will read then. The application is P10-2019, Primrose Schools, 23 
Nevsky Street, Block 590, Lot 14. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it complete but quick, uh, recognizing the late hour. My name is Jim Stahl, S-T-A-H-L. My firm is Boris Gold and Foley, Vignolo, Hyman Stahl, North Brunswick, New Jersey. I'm covering tonight for David Himmelman, who had a, uh, a, a personal family issue, uh, so he could not make it. Uh, but sometimes we interchange. Uh, we're like twins, I like to tell people. Uh, I'm here. We have three witnesses, uh, which we will move. We have the operations. We have the uh, engineer, who happens to be also a traffic engineer and a professional planner. So we'll move through that. And then we have the architect, who will just do the, uh, uh, the internal circulation and the facade area. We do have, but I do not intend to call him, the LSRP. We will provide the board, as they have requested, as Mr. McNell requested, uh, a phase one of the property is, is under control, and we will satisfy Mr. McNell's legitimate, well, they're all legitimate, uh, and reasonable requests. Uh, as you can see from the plans, it's a 12,000 uh, and change facility uh, of an existing building. I will tell you that it is going to be a child care facility. The other potential tenant for the other part of the building is not as yet determined. We are not the owner. We are the applicant. The owner has obviously uh, consented to this. And Mr. Rubin, can I, can I assume we have jurisdiction? You, the board has jurisdiction. Thank you very much. And I'd like to just acknowledge uh, for the record that I have received, or the applicant has received, uh, two reports from Bignell, uh, one uh, May 2, a second review of May 24, and the uh, Delaware and Raritan report dated June 8, 2019, and Stonehill, our engineers, had, did a response, Stonefield, I'm sorry, on May 17. All right, uh, Mr. Taylor, will you stand and raise your right hand? Um, uh, Madam Chair, before you start? Yes, Mr. Bignell. My latest planning review says June 4th. Do you have that one, uh, Mr. I'm Stahl? sorry, uh, Hank. What did I say? June 4, yes. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, please uh, state and spell your name for the record. Good evening. My name is Matt Taylor. Uh, I run development on the East Coast for Primrose well, Schools. This I told you I was going to call. Qualify, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, by whom are you presently employed? Please do. Uh, Primrose Schools. And for how long have you been so employed? Three and a half years with Primrose Schools. And prior to that, were you also in the child care business? Uh, for a, a total of about 18 years, I've done development work for various child care companies. And with regard to Primrose, how many uh, facilities have you been involved in obtaining an approval? Uh, approximately 50 with Primrose. And probably 50 prior, is that correct? Correct. I can then assume that you. Uh, have uh, intimate information and knowledge as to the operation of the child care. Is that correct? Correct. Uh, I, Madam Chair, lady, I mean, I just would like him the board to accept him as an expert, if you will, even though he's a lay person in the field of child care operations and uh, uh, approval. What's his title with Primrose? Your title, sir? I am development manager for the East Coast for Primrose Schools. And how long have you held that position? Approximately three and a half years, ma'am. He's been in the industry approximately 18, Madam Chair. Okay. And there, there's no licenses, special license? Uh, there are. Uh, we have a whole operations group that work in tandem with, with my group. Um, I am more responsible for the development piece and the real estate piece, working with our operations folks to make sure that we qualify sites that will meet um, the licensing for the states we're working in. Obviously, in this case, New Jersey, Child and Family Services. Okay, I'm just going to check with our council. I can accept him in his field? Or? I mean, is he going to be offering a ping testimony or fact no, testimony? I really don't have to qualify, Mr. Rubin. I just want to, uh, he's not, a, he's not a, uh, an expert. Uh, you can. You as an expert in the field of operations and development of a facility, I just wanted that to be on the record. So I don't really need uh, an acknowledgement of expertise. I think he'll okay. demonstrate that. I would, I would, I think he's a fact witness. If he needs to be given opinions, we can revisit the question. That's fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Good. All right, Mr. Taylor, if I may just go ahead, tell this board, please, from beginning to end, uh, the operations, uh, uh, food service, if any, 
supervision, number of children, uh, uh, drop off and pick up, et cetera. Absolutely. And I'll try to keep this brief. I, I realize you guys have had a long night so far. Uh, Primrose Schools has been uh, in business for about 35 years uh, as of 2018. We operate over 400 schools across the country. Uh, again, my area is sort of east of the Mississippi, for lack of a better term, but what I do for development. Uh, this particular development uh, is very similar to what we've done in other places in New Jersey. It'll have approximately 190 children of licensed occupancy. Typically, we run about 85% occupied on average as a company. Uh, this school may be a little higher, maybe a little less, but um, we try to license them from an efficiency standpoint so the staff can flex around in different age groups in the building. So from an economic model, it makes it work better. This is uh, very typical. Um, although it's a renovation, our schools are usually somewhere between 11 and 13,000 square feet. This happens to be 11,000 almost 500 square feet. Uh, we would have 22 staff when fully occupied, but again, I, I think we'll probably be more in the mid 80s from an occupancy standpoint. Um, the building, we'll get into the specifics of it from an engineering and design standpoint, but uh, it lends itself well to childcare because we have access to two sides of the building for play area. Uh, we want to develop a building where Children can leave their respective classrooms and get to their respective play areas without having to go through a maze of quarters or have to cross parking lots or we obviously want to make it a safe situation. The play area will be fenced. Uh, I know it was the desire of the board to have a uh, solid fencing along portions of the playground, which uh, we're fine with. Uh, typically, we don't do that, uh, but I, I feel comfortable in this situation that it's not going to create a problem. Uh, I feel we have adequate parking. Uh, more than adequate parking, really, for this operation based on where it's located. Uh, from a pickup and drop off standpoint, we don't operate like a typical day school or, or an elementary school. We have a staggered pickup and drop off. It's usually 6 30 a.m. to about 9 30 a.m., where parents have to physically park their car, bring their child or children into the school, sign them in, bring them to their classroom, and then back in their car and leave. The pickup is around you know, 3.30 to 6.30 as well. Same operation, they need to come in, sign their children out, bring them out to their car. Uh, and I want to make the point too that oftentimes, you know, we talk about the occupancy of these buildings. We'll have parents who have multiple children, sometimes one, two, even three siblings will go to the school at the same time. So when we look at parking and the ratios to parking, it works pretty well. Uh, I don't see any issues with this, nor do I want to design something that isn't going to work and it's convenient for our parents. Uh, from a food service standpoint, we have what we call a warming pantry. Uh, we don't really prepare food. It's pre-prepared. It's heated. Uh, it's, it's a menu-based um, organic product, but we're not, unlike a restaurant, we're not cooking things over a stove. Everything is, is pre-prepared and heated and served. Um, that's really our operation. If there's we have any. A, uh, we have a safety program in connection with emergencies, uh, protection of the children uh, in the event of uh, fire or other tragedy? Absolutely. And I can certainly provide that to the board. Um, I don't have it with me. Uh, we have an extensive safety manual for any situation you can think of. Uh, you know, the unfortunate world we all live in now, uh, there's a lot of situations that have been added recently to that. Um, but I'll provide that electronically to the board um, post this meeting. And the, uh, although uh, Mr. Levo is going to direct discuss it later, there is a request for an old, a sign which exceeds the uh, provisions of the Edison Township Ordinance. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, the we monument sign that's about 16 feet larger than permitted. Is that correct? Correct. Right. And and really, the why we're proposing something larger than what the township typically would like is the sign is more sign than it is actual signage. It's a large monument that will be a stone and brick to match the building. The actual lettering and logo of the sign is much smaller. We just find it's a prototypical sign that we like to use, um, but the actual sign area is well within the criteria of what the, the township uh, ordinance requires. That's all I have. Of this 
Madam Chair. Yeah. Mr. Peasy. Uh, Matt, is uh, Primrose school, school a uh, franchise? It is, and that's a good point. I, I should have brought that up when I was discussing the school. Uh, it is a franchised operation. What my group and the rest of the Primrose folks do corporately is develop these uh, sites to a point where we get permits and everything ready to go, and we'll work with the franchisee to finance the development, oversee the development, and help them get the school open but they are franchised operation. And, and uh, you have standards and the franchisees have to meet your standards? Absolutely, we have very strict standards. Um, and I will tell you from a, we're very proud to say from an operations standpoint, uh, over the last 35 years in 400 plus schools, uh, we've only closed one or two schools. So it's a, it's a very good record. We're highly rated uh, in the franchise industry, number one in the uh, franchise childcare industry. Madam Chair, what are the age ranges of the children in the school? Excellent question. I, again, I should have covered that. Uh, six weeks of age for infants to five years of age. And we may do uh, an after school program, and that's somewhat of a call based on how the school uh, occupancy ramps up. We've designed the school to accommodate that, uh, but that's something we won't really know until we've been in operation for a year or two. Can you remind me of a couple of questions, if I may? Sure. We're doing five days a week, Monday through Friday. Is that correct? Yes, and that's we're, good. I mean, Keep anticipating them off. during the year, you may have open houses or other activities from time to time on the weekends. Am I correct? You're correct, but that's a very uh, it's a seldom occurrence that we have that. Um, that's the nice thing about child care, especially when you're surrounded by uh, residential neighborhoods. Uh, weekends, it's basically dormant, which is which is always attractive. So it's a five-day-a-week operation. We do have uh, graduation-type things once in a while. Again, it's limited to one or two classrooms, so it might be 20 or 30 children. Uh, never is uh, the school going to be operated where every occupant has a parent there. We obviously couldn't accommodate it, and it, that's not how we operate. I believe you made a comment that the sign you believe falls within the allowable size and everything of that nature. Is that what I heard from no, you? No, I'm sorry. What I was trying to qualify is that the overall size of the physical structure does not meet your ordinance. The actual lettering and you know logo that's part of the sign uh, is well within your criteria. And I, I was trying to make the point is that we have a, a typically sized monument sign that we use that we feel has a good visibility from the street. And we try to accomplish that same size sign where we you know, from a prototypical standpoint, where we can. So I, I apologize if I misled you on that. This is the sign, uh, Mr. Bignell, that you referred to in your uh, comment of that's going to require a variance. Yes. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Peasy. Uh, Matt, you mentioned that you're staffing of 22, 22 people? Correct. And, and that's not, is that staggered through the day? It is staggered. Um, oftentimes, we have part-time employees uh, who are working when their children, maybe have school-age children that are in school. So it's a fair amount of part-time folks coming and going, um, but it is staggered. And, and I only mentioned that for determination of the, uh, the parking requirements for your staff. I, absolutely. Uh, and I will tell you that we've got uh, dedicated, based on our lease, we've got a dedicated 45 parking spaces. Uh, it's more than enough from my past experience. Um, we're very comfortable that'll work well. Okay. And we've designed a site to accommodate uh, the pickup and drop off at the curb closest to the entrance, which is you know also served by a sidewalk. We always wanna make sure we provided a safe uh, ingress and egress for kids in and out. Madam Chair. Yes. So Mr. what are you Correct. saying? You're saying that the spaces along the front entrance will be marked for drop off and pick up? They'll be marked with signage for pick up and drop off, okay. yes. Thank you. Yep. What, what is the average time that a parent, that if you know, that a parent takes to park, take the child or children in, and return to the car? Sure, we've actually done uh, multiple studies on this, um, so I know it all too well. But it's, it's somewhere between seven to 10 minutes, depending on how quick a parent is. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, if anyone on the board at one point or another has utilized child care, like I certainly have in my past. Um, you, learn, you, you get pretty efficient at it. So we're very comfortable that the parking at the front of the school will more than accommodate that. Okay, that's all I have. 
seeing any other questions. Thank you. Your next witness. I appreciate the board's time. Thank sure. you. Certainly, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, members of the public. My name is Charles Olivo, O-L-I-V as in Victor O. Stonefield Engineering and Design, located at 92 Park Avenue, Rutherford, New Jersey. Well, before you do, I, uh, Mr. Olivo, can you please tell the board your educational experience and licensure as an engineer? Yes, I have a Bachelor of Science in the field of Civil Engineering from the University of Notre Dame. I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of New Jersey. I hold licensure throughout the East Coast from Maine to Florida, where I've been involved in over 100 land development projects in the capacity as a civil engineer. I'm also a certified professional traffic operations engineer, certified by the Institute of Transportation Engineers. I've been qualified before over 150 municipalities in the state of New Jersey as an expert in the field of traffic engineering. I'm also a licensed planner in the state of New Jersey, having provided testimony before numerous boards in that capacity. I will be offering testimony this evening as an expert in the field of civil engineering, traffic engineering, and professional planning. I may uh, ask that he be qualified as an expert in have those you, three disciplines. Have you um, testified before Edison Planning Board? I have. It, it has been some time since I've been here. It's a pleasure to be back. Hmm. Okay. We'll accept you as an expert in your field. In the, you have licenses in the state of New Jersey for all three. As a I do. planner, traffic engineer, and then civil engineering. Yes, I do. Okay. And with your permission, I had asked uh, Mitchell Levo to do one of the things. He's going to do his engineering, then he's going to do either his traffic, and then his planning, and then, of course, uh, the board is ask any questions they want. Very good. Thank you. Great. And what I'd like to do is walk over to the easel where we have the site plan set up and walk through the site plan package which has been prepared and submitted to the board. Just for reference purposes, the site plan document prepared by Stonefield Engineering and Design last revised May 17th, 2019. And this is a complete set of documents, sheets C1 through C13. Mr. Rubin, since this document a. replicates what's before. Exhibit a, please. A. A1. A1. Thank you. Now, what's being proposed, as you've heard from Project Council, as well as from Mr. Taylor, is we are taking an existing vacant building that is located along Nevsky Street, and we are proposing to adaptively reuse a portion of that building, just under about 11,500 square feet of building area, proposing to reuse building, reactivate a portion of this building, and bring life back into it, essentially along the Nevsky Street frontage. So what I'd like to do is referred to sheet C4, which is the site plan exhibit. Building footprint remains the same. Access plan, under existing conditions, we have two access points that are located along the east and the west property line. And just to orient the board, located along the bottom of the exhibit is Nevsky Street, and located, we'll call it towards the top, is the north cardinal direction. So Park Avenue is just off to the right-hand side of the exhibit, off to the east side of the site. We are located along a local roadway. Park Avenue is a county roadway, which is located just to the east. Under existing conditions, there are two full movement access points. What we are proposing as part of the redevelopment program of the site is to consolidate access along the frontage of Nevsky Street to create one full movement access point to and from the public roadway system. We're keeping the building footprint the same. As you've heard from Mr. Taylor, 
we are essentially in an L-shaped pattern where the driveway was once located along that area. We are creating a very natural area for the playground of the child care center for Primrose. Now, as you've heard from Mr. Taylor, it's quite common that a child care center is mistaken in operations for a school, elementary school, but it is extremely different. And Mr. Taylor has touched upon this in terms of the nature of the operations. It is very gradual and staggered in the way that it generates traffic into and out of the subject property. And so when we get into the specifically traffic testimony, we'll speak about the levels of trip generation that we expect during the peak hours of usage of this type of site and this type of land use. And in addition to that, we'll talk about how many cars you can expect to be in the parking lot during typical times of day. So generally speaking, the hours of operation early in the morning from about 6, 6.30 in the morning to 6.30 in the evening. In terms of what is being proposed in site improvements, I've spoken about the playground area that would be created along the southerly and easterly side of the buildings. We are proposing a new sidewalk area where the front door, which is on the westerly facade of the building, would be located. There would be stairs as well as a switchback ramp for ADA accessibility into the doorway that's located on the west side of the building. Now we are located in the RI1 zone, which is the restricted industry district. However, when referencing Big Nell's letter, as well as looking at the, the code that we are within here, a child care center operation is a permitted use within Edison in the non-residential area. So this is a permitted use. This is a largely compliant use. When referring to sheet C4 within the set, if you to look at the bulk requirements within this zoning area, we are just over about two acres in square footage. We are compliant with regard to lot area, lot width, side yard setback, rear yard setback, building coverage, height, as well as floor area ratio, just quickly scanning through some of the bulk criteria for use of this type. And so in many ways, we meet the spirit of the zoning within this area. Later on, as part of planning testimony, we'll speak about what is previously contemplated within the RI1 zone and, and what is being proposed here. But in terms of parking on the site, under existing conditions, there are approximately 99 parking stalls. As part of the improvements being made with regard to the playground area, as well as some of the parking improvements and the sidewalk improvement along the westerly side of the building, in the proposed condition, we are proposing 88 parking stalls. As you've heard from the operator, more than adequate to accommodate the primrose use. Primrose typically targets around 40 parking stalls, give or take 40 to 45 parking stalls for this type of operation. That leaves a balance of parking which would be adequate for an additional user within the property. So as we look at the parking and circulation, generally speaking throughout the subject site, the circulation aisles range anywhere from 20 to 26 and actually 28 feet in the northerly portion of the site. And areas of activity for the parking and unparking maneuvers of parents that are dropping off children, you have that industry standard of 25 feet in a double loaded parking aisle that's located to the west of the building. So you have 12 parking stalls which are located directly adjacent to the sidewalk and front door. On the opposite side of that circulation aisle, another 13 parking stalls. And then just to the north of that area, another 17 parking stalls. That brings you to about 42 total parking stalls in that general vicinity, which we would expect if the board was inclined to approve the project, that those parking stalls are the ones that would be most utilized by the Primrose Child Care Center. Now, as it relates to other site improvements Excuse that are me. being proposed as part of the project. Let's interrupt.
interrupt for a moment? Oh, of course. Charles, uh, Mr. Pignell, uh, the access aisles, you had indicated there's a violation. Right where you were pointing to, uh, Charles, there's a, it's, I think the access aisle is only 21 feet wide, and I believe we need a requirement of 24 feet. That's Are correct. Are asking for a variance there? We would be asking for a design waiver in that regard. I would defer to Mr. Bignell as to the classification of that. How, however, if you look throughout the balance of the site, there is one area where that 21 feet pinches down. In my opinion, and I can speak about it as part of the traffic testimony, that would not create a hazardous area of circulation or driving, so we would seek the necessary waiver as required. Madam Chair, to you, um you're correct on the uh, reduced aisle width. We, we, we always uh, view them as variances. So it's an existing condition. That's, that's the other uh, situation here. And should that be the case, we would seek that variance. As it relates to other bulk standard deviations, primarily we're looking at existing nonconformities. We are seeking what I'll call a new variance, the sign variance, which you'll hear more information about the size of that sign, the location of the sign. However, there are existing nonconformities that we would come to you seeking variances for as well. The front yard setback is an existing nonconformity. As I mentioned, the building footprint itself is not changing as part of this application. And so we are seeking a variance for that existing nonconformity where 75 feet is required and we are just under 50 feet at 49.4 feet. Also, as it relates to impervious coverage on the site, the requirement within the zone is 70%. We are actually reducing impervious coverage as part of this project, increasing the landscaping. And so planning testimony and support will be put forth as to the justifications for those variances. But that is essentially a summary of the variances required. What's existing and what's proposed on, on lot coverage? The existing lot coverage is 77.9%. The proposed is 73.9%. Because Mr. Bignell's um, chart on his report says proposed is 77.9. That's incorrect is what you're saying? That may have been transposed from the existing. We are under the proposed condition the number that I, I just mentioned, I apologize, 73.9, 73 correct. As it relates to other features of the site, in general, our utility connections are being provided from the Nevsky Street public right-of-way. We would generally continue to maintain those utility connections where we can. We are resizing the water line to be more appropriate to the land use that we have here, but electric, gas, sanitary, all being provided to the south of the building footprint. Again, this building exists, has utility connections we will reuse to the extent that we can. From a grading perspective, stormwater management perspective, that is all essentially being maintained in the proposed condition. Generally speaking, a flat site does move slightly from west to east along the roadway and along the property, about three to four feet across the property frontage. Under existing conditions, you do have inlets and conveyance systems that outlet to the west, and those would be maintained in the proposed condition as well. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Bignell. Yeah, I looked at the, uh, the um, maximum building coverage, the ordinance, the maximum building and paving um, allows a maximum of 70%. The existing is 77.9%, and their proposal is 73.9%, so they're lessening it, but it still requires the variance. Okay. But it's an existing condition, too, so. Thank you, Mr. Bignell. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bignell. And in terms of the, the lighting being proposed, we are planning on build, and this is referring to sheet C6, we are proposing to bring the lighting up to more current standards using very clean lit LED fixtures. And so what we are proposing are a number of, you'll see on the detail, wall mounted and pole mounted light fixtures. The pole mounted light fixtures are proposed 
in the southwesterly portion of the site, the area that is most proximate to where you'd have pickup and drop off. And there are a number of wall sconces surrounding the building that would be directed downwards. If you refer to the requirements of lighting within the zone, we meet those requirements and comply as shown within the table located to the upper left-hand side of the page. So we are meeting the requirements as indicated within this particular zone. Obviously, you want the, the lighting of the site to engender a safe environment, effective for the purposes of pedestrian activity as well as vehicular activity. Now, as we've spoken about, this is a largely dormant use during the very early mornings and the later evening or darker periods and on the weekends is not being utilized. So in some ways is similar to some of the commercial or office operators that may be contemplated when you strictly look at the restricted industry zone. Referring to the landscaping plan, now in front of the building today, what you effectively have is a, a natural grass or turf area. What we are proposing is, generally speaking, a low wall that's located along the outside edge of the playground area. And then we are creating, and to some extent mimicking what's on the opposite side of the roadway, where you do have a wood stockade fence we would have a solid fence along the top of the wall, and that was a compromise from the operator. It's not something that they look to have surrounding the playground area, just for the purposes of visibility into that area. But given the uniqueness of this site, in the spirit of cooperation, there is a six foot tall stockade type fence, or solid fence, I should call it, that's located, that will be proposed along that wall. In addition to that, we are proposing new street trees along that area to certainly fit with the corridor of, of <coughs> Nevsky Street. We have found a number of different areas within the site proximate to the front door to locate additional trees on the site. And then what we're proposing to do is utilize a number of native grasses as well as decorative boulder elements along the southerly side of the wall and the fence. So as you're driving down Nevsky Street, either to the west or to the east towards park, this obviously creates a nice sense of place and I think dovetails very nicely with the residential across the street and then as you continue <coughs> in a westerly direction, some of the changing land uses that we have here. From a landscape and buffer requirement perspective, we've also indicated any of the, the required tree replacement or installation. We agree to comply with those standards and we are proposing, as I mentioned, five street trees where none are existing today. So we do think from an aesthetic perspective that this will improve the condition of the frontage under existing conditions. And then lastly, as part of the site plan information, what I'd like to do is refer within the site plan set. You may hear additional testimony from the project architect, but it's been touched upon by Mr. Taylor in terms of the signage. So on sheet C12, upper right hand corner, detail number three, you will see a call out and details of the signage itself. So as Mr. Taylor spoke about, and I think this gives a very good indication of, of what he mentioned, that the, the words on the sign, the signage elements themselves, although we're seeking a variance of 16 square feet from the requirement, we are proposing a 10 foot by 7 foot monument sign to be located in the required setback from the roadway. This is for the purposes of visibility of a motorist being able to identify the Primrose Child Care Center. If you were to look at the monument sign, you'd notice that at the very top of the monument sign is the branded element of Primrose, which is the rooster, 42 inch diameter sign. Then throughout, you'll see a stone look, brick look, as mentioned 
by Mr. Taylor. And in the center part of that monument sign enclosure, there is the sign element of Primrose School of Edison. And that sign is seven foot four by two foot eight. Now, in addition to that, as we look at signage, as it relates to the facade signs, the actual signage along the facades of the building, we are the allowable signs, we are allowed to have 150 square feet of signage affixed to the building, and we are proposing two of the Primrose School branded elements atop an architectural feature that amount to just under 10 square feet each. So if you look on aggregate of the square footage of the signage that could be provided on a building such as this within the zone, we are well below the square footage, the allowable square footage of that signage. And that is essentially my civil engineering testimony. I'm happy to transition into traffic engineering testimony if that's the board's pleasure. I think we should have left the board. Of, yes, thank you. From a traffic engineering perspective. I'm sorry, Mr. Bignell. Mr. Bignell, do you have any comments about the size of that freestanding sign? Uh, I don't have any problems with it. Mr. Mr. Pippen, I haven't really signed, no problems with the sign. We have prepared a traffic impact study for the redevelopment of the front portion of this building. That included an existing conditions analysis looking at the intersection of Nevsky and Park. We conducted traffic counts, turning movement counts during the typical morning peak hours and also during the typical weekday evening peak hours. And generally speaking, those are the peak hours sometimes referred to as the commuter rush periods from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. during the morning, and from 4 p.m. to about 7 p.m. in the evening. And all of that information is provided within the traffic impact study. We then fast forward to a future condition without the subject property redeveloped in this fashion. That is referred to as a no-build condition development that looks at ambient growth, population growth. It also looks at the repopulation of and as of right use of the approximately 24,000 square feet that's located in the two-story portion of the building just to the north of where the Primrose would be going. And so we've contemplated the traffic of that area being reoccupied and also the Primrose Child Care Center going in. And that then creates the build condition, which is the future condition with the redevelopment program that you see here. As I mentioned, and generally in accordance with traffic engineering recommendations and guidelines, we have removed an access point and consolidated all access to one full movement curb cut along the site frontage. Generally speaking, this removes or reduces friction along roadways. Traffic engineering of old would typically space driveways, get as many as you can along the frontage. What we're doing with this opportunity of redevelopment is we are consolidating access to make it safe and effective in the proposed condition. As part of the future build condition with this redevelopment program, we have projected the traffic associated with a child care center of this size, just under about 11,500 square feet. We look to the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual, we also look to the operator. Our firm has studied about 20 to 25 child care centers, very familiar with the ebb and flow of traffic associated with child care centers as well. Generally speaking, as you've heard from Mr. Taylor, drop off is a little bit quicker than pickup, anywhere from that seven to 10 minute, but you will find that parents over the course of routine and time can often conduct drop off during the morning and anywhere from a three to five minute range. But we do conservatively look at some of the numbers that Mr. Taylor had mentioned as part of pick up and drop off for this type of use. There is no conventional queuing as you would see at a school. What happens at a school is 100% of your traffic comes during about a 15 to 20 minute period. 
And what that does is create a surge in traffic that then queues along pickup, drop-off areas. This type of operation is very different. 100% of your traffic comes over about a three to three and a half hour window. So it's much more gradual and much more staggered. What that amounts to for any given snapshot in time, if you were to fly overhead and look at the parking lot in terms of how many parents are dropping off at one time, it'd be anywhere from about six to eight cars during peak times. So that number of parking stalls that we're targeting, about 40 to 45, would be more than adequate to accommodate the anticipated demand. Your staff builds up throughout the course of the day. Some members of the staff coming during the early morning hours and then continue to gradually come in until about 11 a.m., at which time you'd be fully staffed, and then you essentially reverse that pattern during the evening peak or the afternoon peak from about 3 to 7 p.m. So in terms of the trip generation during the highest times, we have calculated that. We've then conveyed it through the driveway along with the reoccupation of the office or commercial or we'll call it restricted industrial space. And we've conveyed that traffic through the unsignalized stop control intersection of Park and Nevsky. And we found in the build condition that there would be acceptable levels of service during the morning and the evening peak hour, level of service D or better at all movements during all times, at both the driveways and at the public intersection as well. So from a traffic perspective, the redevelopment program would not be expected to significantly impact the roadway conditions here. All of your traffic is coming in and out of the intersection to the east. Just to the south, about 500 feet, is the closest traffic signal. That is generally what provides gaps in traffic to allow for vehicles to exit and enter to and from Nevsky Street. So that works well as a complement to the traffic generation patterns of this proposed redevelopment. From a parking perspective, as I've mentioned, as part of the circulation and the traffic, and I'll touch upon the circulation aisles themselves, but from parking in terms of requirement, and Mr. Bignell points this out in his letter, that there is some vague element of childcare in New Jersey not necessarily having a specific parking requirement. However, from an operations perspective, we do expect that number to be approximately 40 to 45. That would leave a balance of about, we have 88 total parking stalls, so about equal split between the various users of these sites or of these building portions. And obviously, any user that would come after us within the portion of the building to the north would have the ability, if the board approves the primrose, to look at the operation under existing conditions. Lease agreements are crafted accordingly. It becomes somewhat of a self-correcting or self-policing element of the project. Generally speaking, a lighter industrial use or a commercial building or an office use that we would anticipate in this area, which is, is largely matched in the, the north area or in the rear of the site by industrial users, somewhere in the two to two and a half per thousand range, which is right about exactly where we are for the balance of the square footage of this building. So from a parking perspective, there's adequate parking to accommodate the building areas being utilized as they've been conceived here. So from a parking perspective, we have adequate parking. Circulation, as you come into the site, you have a 25-foot aisle. The majority of parking that would serve the primrose, also a 25-foot aisle. A small area that pinches down to 21 feet and then opens up to 37 feet. So only about two stalls are impacted by that area. And that is a single loaded area. There are not parking stalls on the opposite side. And so as part of preparing site plans and traffic engineering studies for a number of different types of sites, you will see that in areas that are not double loaded, parking on both sides, that you can neck down and that effectively works well. It also creates somewhat of a traffic calming element as you then travel to the north and we'll call it bearing to the east as well. Circulation aisle opens up 25 feet, 25 feet, 28 feet as you move to the north and to the east. 
It's from a parking perspective, a circulation aisle perspective, the dimensions, what we're providing would be more than adequate to accommodate the users of the site. If there are any questions about traffic, I'd be happy to answer those. Yes, Charles. Uh, quickly, that uh, intersection of Nevsky and Park Avenue. Yes. What is the level of service now, and what will it be after the build? In the build condition, the level of service of the eastbound movement, and I'm referring to pages 5, simply page 5 of the traffic impact study. You'll see the morning and the evening peak hour, and we are moving from levels of service B, A, C, and A for the morning and the evening, respectively, to slight degradations and delay C, A, D, and B. And in Edison and in surrounding areas, during the highest peak hours of the day, these are generally deemed to be acceptable. During off-peak times, you'd have lower levels of service, or I would call it better, more favorable levels of service. And in the way in which a primrose would gradually have traffic moving in and out, you can imagine 6.30, 7 a.m. before the commuter rush period, you would experience improved levels of service. Good evening, Madam Chair. Ladies, can we move now to the planning testimony and complete the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Peasy. Charles, the, um, uh, the back of the um, um, building that is not the um, primrose. Yes. They have some parking stalls and uh, how did they negotiate coming out of there? The, the, the parking cars. stalls, which, which ones exactly? That would be, uh, I guess if this is the north, that'll be on the, uh, uh, west side of the wall. The west side of the wall of the northerly portion of the building? Yes. The parallel stalls? Yes. Yes. In that area of the yeah, site, there are, 28 of them. I'm sorry? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Oh, 10. Oh, the east side? should be the east side. The east side where there's a dead end aisle before right. you come to the exactly. playground area. Exactly. Yes. There are 12 parking stalls located along the east side of the building. And you do have a turnaround area that's 26 feet wide. So if you were to not find parking within that area, you could turn around just to the south. I'm sorry. You could turn around just to the south of the southernmost parking stall. So you're not trapped in that area. If you park in the stalls themselves, you have the benefit of a 26-foot aisle, which you can back into and then head in a northerly direction. So you would be able to effectively move in and out of that area. Okay, anyone else? Okay. Great, well we are located, as I previously mentioned, within the RI1, the Restricted Industry District. And we are complemented in this area, if you were to drive through this area by a number of industrial uses, commercial uses, community centers, residential uses as well. As I mentioned, a child care center in a non-residential zone is considered to be a permitted use. From a zoning perspective, I would generally say that the relief we are seeking as part of this application is minimal. As you've heard, there are a number of existing non-conformities of the site Front yard setback is an existing nonconformity that we would be seeking a front yard variance from. In addition to that, in terms of the impervious coverage, we are lessening the impervious coverage as part of the development of the site, still seeking a variance as we recognize that existing nonconformity exists slightly over the 70% in the proposed condition and the sign. I've spoken about the square footages 
of the signs that we are allowed to have within this zone, and on aggregate, we are well below. However, as a technical variance, we are seeking a 70 square foot sign where a 54 square foot sign is required within the zone. So I would look to the zoning relief as it relates to the flexible C balancing test, or C2 variance criteria, which is effectively that the benefits outweigh any detriments and that we are advancing the purposes of the municipal land use law as part of the granting of these variances that are being proposed. I would also group into that what we've previously spoken about as the one area where the circulation aisle next down to 21 feet. Mr. Bignell spoke about that being a variance, so I'd group that within the C2 variance as well. And we can look at the pull-in case as it relates to the benefits of the entire project being redeveloped in the, in the way that it has been conceived as substantially outweighing any detriments. A child care center within New Jersey, per the statute, is considered to be an inherently benef beneficial use of vital importance in the land use plan. That's irrelevant to C variance. Understood. Simply stating it for the record. But this is a C variance as stated by your council. And so when we look to the purposes of the municipal land use law that are being furthered as part of the project, I would look at purpose A, which is promoting the health, welfare, and safety of both those that live within this area, those that would inhabit the building. Purpose M, the efficient use of land. We are adaptively reusing a building. We are reducing the impervious coverage of the site. And we are also reusing parking areas to be shared by various users of the building in and of itself. This is an effective and efficient use of land. And purpose I, which is to promote a desirable visual impact and environment when producing a project of this nature. Architectural plans have been provided within the board set. You can see that aesthetically, this is something that would be very pleasing to the eye in terms of the architecture of the building, the signage, the landscaping, all of these elements, I think, <clears throat> further this purpose I as provided within the municipal land use law. Now, as it relates to any detriments that are created and would the granting of the variances create any substantial impairment to the zone plan or would they have a substantial detriment to the public good? When we look at the, the detriments as they're balanced, looking at the negative criteria, as I've mentioned, starting first with the front yard setback, we're softening that front yard setback by creating a well-landscaped area, a well-buffered area, not to mention the fact that those that is an existing non-conformity on the site today. Impervious coverage is being lessened. The combination of trees on the site, street trees along the frontage, I believe creates a landscaping type of effect, green area that certainly helps to mitigate and soften any detriment created by an impervious coverage variance, which is also an existing nonconformity. The signage, as shown in the detail provided within the site plan set, is attractive. It has elements that gesture to the building itself, certainly the area surrounding. So from a signage square footage perspective, when we look at the totality of signage, we are well below the allowable signage, and we are treating it at a level that's at scale with the neighborhood and in scale with the building as well. So it is my opinion that these variances can be granted without detriment to the public good or any impairment to the zone plan or the master plan. So all I have of that witness. Yes. I have a question, Attorney but Robert? I'm going to defer the board first. I have a question for the witness, if I may. Yes. <clears throat> According to Mr. Bignell's report, number seven, the office space totals 24,270 square feet, that, or the unused portion of this property totals 24,276 square feet, <clears throat> which at a, at a rate of one space per 300 square feet would need 81 spaces. If 45 of the 88 spaces 
are, have been dedicated to the child care use, does that mean that anything that, basically anything that goes in this additional space will need a parking variance? Looking at the, the parking requirement of the, the office or the commercial space located to the north, yes. Now, when we refer to the combination of uses that we have here, as Mr. Bignell points out, child care is essentially exempt. But functionally, Counselor, as you've mentioned, yes, it would require a variance. Looking at the Institute of Transportation Engineers Parking Generation Manual, we're watching as part of the, the newest parking generation manual, the parking generation rates of offices beginning to fall year over year as part of some of the newest data being provided. So as the owner or consultant to the owner of the property, generally speaking, I would say from a functional perspective that the amount of parking being provided on the site would be adequate to accommodate a Primrose Child Care Center as well as the balance of the property. But if we have but to- you're, given, you're, you're only leaving them less than 50% or approximately 50% of what they would require under the ordinance. Mr. Rubin, may I respond to you on, the, on this issue? And, and then you can go back. Sure, I'm Wait, just right. trying to no, know, no, get I, the we, record straight. That's we, all no, I'm no. trying to do. We anticipated a question from either you or from the board on this issue. It is our position that there are certain lease restraints that the owner has imposed upon the balance of the site with regard to certain non-permitted uses. It's our position Primrose is in. They have, if, you, if you grant the approval, they are in with their 40 uh, spaces or 42. The next use comes in and comes in for tenancy review. The zoning officer says no because you don't have enough parking or the use is not appropriate and they come before you uh, or the zoning board. That, and with all due respect, not to you, to the next user, that's his or her problem. If they don't get the use because they don't have enough parking, that's a different problem, and I'm not laying it on you. We have enough parking for our use. If the next user doesn't, they're not gonna get a CO, or they're gonna have to prove to the satisfaction of this board and the, or the zoning officer that there's adequate parking. So while I respect, I anticipated that, but I don't think it's something that you should uh, impose upon this applicant who has sufficient parking and has demonstrated uh, an appropriate site plan. No, I just, I just I would, think it's I important just for the board to recognize that they're creating a variance condition by approving this application. I'm not, su I'm not sure of that, because if you look closely what uh, Hank is saying there, the 81 space is for, is for the entire building, right. not just for no, the no, primrose. No, 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 it's a two-story space that's the, that the vacant portion is two-story and it's 24,000 square feet. The vacant portion is 24,000 square feet. It shows. What is the balance of the building after the allocation to Primrose? What's left? In terms of the square footage? Yes. Just over 24,000. Right. So the whole building is 36,000. So it'll be 24. But we don't know what that use would be. Correct. 24,276. And if you divide that by 300 square feet, you get. 81 spaces, there's no parking requirement for the daycare. So you can't require them to give you, get a variance or something that they don't. No, no, no. Well, my, what my point you're is being no. You're being practical. No, they're, they're, they, they, their lease has allocated 45 spaces to this use. Yes, that leaves 43 spaces left, regardless of how you may calculate or not calculate the square footage allocation for the daycare center, 43 spaces left for 24,270 square feet of space. And what I'm saying is simply that the board needs to understand that because of the lease that allocates 45 spaces to this use, they're, they're, by approving this, they're creating a, vari a, a variance condition no, no matter what goes in this other space. I, Mr. I have just been advised by Mr. Taylor, uh, who was under oath, that he misspoke uh, that the Lease provides for 25 dedicated spaces uh, for the the, uh, the child care. So 25 spaces, and I think that there were 20 plus or minus uh, 
employees on a staggered basis, plus the remaining parking field. Uh, again, yeah. No, no. I mean, so my position is we don't know what the next use will be. Uh, we don't know whether it's going to be a, uh, whatever it's going to be, it's going to have to live within the parking available. Uh, if it's too intense, it's not, if, I'm sorry. If it's too intense, it's not going to get an approval. Uh, if, it's, if it's a moderate intensity and can live with the spaces, it'll get tenancy approval or approval from one of the boards. So as we've indicated, and, and I'm trying, I, I am being very respectful, I'm not saying you don't have the right or the power. This board has, her, certainly has it, but we should not be, we, Primrose, should not be bound by something that we don't know is going to occur in the future. That's my point. We have the parking, and we have the ability, and the owner's going to have to work it out with the next tenant, and maybe there won't be a tenant for a year, two years, three years. Maybe it will be a small uh, IT company that will uh, uh, have uh, 15 employees and a lot of uh, computers and main, well, we don't use mainframes anymore, uh, <laughs> servers or cloud equipment. I'm showing my age. Uh, but we don't know. And I, I just think the next tenant is going to have to deal with it. And I don't, you know, don't want to waste the board's time. Seems logical to me if the owner wants to possibly forfeit the rental of that back half of the building, it's up to him. Else for comments? Okay. Madam Chair, I don't want to be presumptuous nor deprive the board, but the, um, the licensed architectural plans have been submitted. And if the board, I don't usually like to do this, but recognizing the, the hour and what the board wants to accomplish this evening, I don't know if we really need to put an architect on unless the board feels there's some issues. The primary testimony was that of the engineer involving traffic and planning and operations. So I have the architect here, but I, by the time we go through him, we're going to be, you know, expending some other time. I also have, but I don't intend to put on, the LSRP who came just in case Mr. Bignell or anyone had, or Mr. Anticell had any questions. So I would like to close my, my presentation. Uh, but again, I don't want to be presumptuous and assume anything. Is there a report from the uh, LSRP? For me? Do we, the, the, the LSRP, is there a report? No, but we're prepared to provide a full report, Mr. Bignell, as a condition of the approval. I have no problem with that, just as long as they, that it's, it's allowed by the DEP or the Department of Education, whoever licenses this operation, that they, the kids can be there if there's a contamination on site. There's no contamination or... Yes, we... We've, we've done the phase one, and uh, uh, there will be a full report submitted to you, Mr. Bignell, uh, as a condition and to make sure that you're satisfied. I have no problem with that. The board has no problem with that. But Madam, Madam Chairman, Hank, you asked a specific question about if there's any contamination on the site, and he said he'll issue a report. Is there contamination on the site? I'm looking at the LSRP. There is no contamination. Okay. Well, that was the question, right? That's what you asked. So yeah, I wanted to make it was an industrial property. I just wanted to make sure that it, there wasn't any spills or anything like that because you know, now you're bringing in children, and that's a different animal. It, it, I thank you for the question. Right. This was not just a phase one. This was an entire environmental investigation of the property, and that's what be, would be submitted to Mr. Bignell. There wasn't a walk around. Uh, I mean, I don't want to diminish again what a phase one is, but it was a full examination, and we would submit that to Mr. Bignell. Okay. Thank you. As a condition of approval. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm thinking at this point then open to the public. Well, oh, the, the only, okay. Madam Mr. Chair, Feasy. the only concern I would have architecturally is because you're going to have babies, uh, uh, you know, uh, is the proximity of uh, them to the ex exits. To make sure that they have uh, uh, no uh, obstructions getting those baby uh, trips out. Well, I can put the architect on. 
I, I'm assuming that we would have to comply with uh, yeah. construction code. That's true. That's true. You no, know, no, I don't want to, again, I, I'm trying to be careful, but whatever it is, we've got to have two, two means of ingress and egress. We've got to have safety, and as uh, Mr. Taylor indicated, yeah. they've run 400 units, and he'll submit a safety plan uh, to Mr. Bignell uh, electronically. So let's go out to the public, see what well, we have. Know, we, we didn't go through the expert reports? Or? Yeah, I wanted to go through Mr. Bignell's report. I didn't see anything in DNR. Where's Mr. Olivia? Uh, Thanks. Uh, sir, have you reviewed Mr. Bignell's final uh, technical review? I have, yes. And can you go through that, uh, just advise us as to any items that we have not or cannot comply with? I'll certainly defer to Mr. Bignell if I've missed anything, but I did attempt in my testimony to go through all of the items which had been called out within the, the latest review letter. Was the pipeline buffering in the latest in the latest review? Mr. Bignell? Item K. Let's, I'll make it easy for you. Let's let's go down, let's go to item twelve. Um, I looked for information on the um, the playground allowing a free exit for the um, from the building in a safe area? Do we talk about a safe area? Yes, the safe area is shown on the site plan. It's an inset on the site plan sheet that's located in the southwest portion of the site. Okay. The, um, the no, you can't gain access to the play area from the outside, only from the inside of the building? That is correct. And you can only leave the, you, but you can leave the, the, the play area if there's an emergency from the inside to the outside. Yes. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. The restriction on, on coming from the outside, Mr. Bignell, is so that no one unauthorized attempts to come in, uh, you know, without permission. So that all entry that's come, that's my concern. Well, yeah, well, all entry would have to come through the building. That's fine. But it's a safety. It's like a panic bar. It would be a safety exit if they if they had to. Okay. The, um, on the fence on a gate on the outside of the. Well, You'd be on the. What happens, if, what happens if people are playing in the play area and the building catches on fire? Going back in the building, no. you're be able to get out. They can no, leave. No, no. That's what we're asking for. You can get that. I yes. Just catch that. Okay. Now, Mr. Rubin, to get into the play area, you have to right from the building. But, but you there's can a leave gate the to get out area. if necessary. Right. 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 Okay. We don't want like parents or strange people snatching children without letting people know they're taking children. Okay. Um, the pipeline buffering, there's a letter from Lillian. This is an existing facility. I don't. I think you're doing any digging out there, so I'm not sure how important that is, but um, you can get the letters easy enough from just yes. contacting the pipeline buffer guys. And you already took care of the, in the environmental stuff, so I'm satisfied with my report. Okay, anything from um, Mr. Corley's report? Um, we, we had already spoken with Mr. Olivo, and he's already agreed to address any comments that are outstanding. So I think at this point then I do feel comfortable opening to the public portion. Anyone who would like to speak as to this application, please come forward. Having seen, oh, I saw some movement, no. Having seen and no one come forward, uh, make a motion we close public portion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, make a motion to grant preliminary and final approval of this application, including the requested variances for access aisle. And actually, these first three variances are existing conditions, but the uh, variance, variance for an access aisle where the minimum point is 21 feet, the front yard setback of 49.7 feet, and the new impervious coverage of 73.9, which exceeds 70, 73.9%, which exceeds the 70%, but is less than the existing uh, coverage. And also uh, approval for the freestanding sign, which uh, in the front, which has a 70 square foot uh, dimension as opposed to the uh, requirement of the 54 square foot uh, requirement. Uh, with, uh, make this uh, motion for approval with the following conditions. First and foremost, adherence and acceptance to all of our recommendations from our consultants in their latest letters 
and recommendations, and also a condition that the S that the LSRP must be provided to Mr. Bignell before acceptance. And finally, adding the, our standard proviso that no changes can be made to these conditions of approval without coming back before this board to, re to request their such. Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to second that motion. Okay, Lillian? Mr. Jerry? Yes on the motion? Mr. Pippa? Yes. Mr. Correct? Yes. Council Member Sandelsky? Yes, on the motion. Mr. Soltes? Yes. Mr. Peavy? Yes. Mr. Singh? Yes. Mr. Danielle? Is not present. Mr. Singh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for, for staying so late. Uh, I'm sure the next group appreciates it, but so do we. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yes, and I'm getting the, the yes, signal tell her, again. Tell her, tell her to keep on working. And, <laughs> and she is court reporter extraordinaire, so five minutes. <laughs> Will the meeting please come to order? This is our final application of the night, P11-2019, RG Edison Urban Renewal, LLC, 2165 and 2205 Lincoln Highway, Block 124, Lot 2.E, 6A, and 20.02. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Lisa John Boss with the law firm of Chiesa Shahinian and Jan Tomasi on behalf of the applicant. The applicant uh, is the designated redeveloper as well as the owner of the property in question this evening. This applicant has been working with the township for over two years to redevelop the property, get designated as an area near redevelopment, work with a redevelopment plan that also incorporated the loop oil um, site on the corner that will be uh, spoken about later by our traffic engineer for some needed roadway improvements. And um, we're excited tonight to be presenting a fully conforming preliminary and final site plan approval to the to the board. There's no variances requested, one very minor design waiver related to lighting. Um, as you'll hear in greater detail tonight, this redevelopment project is proposed in two phases per the redevelopment agreement that was entered into between the applicant and the township. Phase one is for the development of um, the development site proper, I would say, and then phase two is going to be an application for roadway improvements that are being worked out and finalized right now with DOT and loop oil because we will need a sliver of their um, property to do those roadway improvements. Loop oil was here this evening earlier uh, and was going to testify in support of our application to let the board know um, firsthand that they are working with us on these roadway improvements that will come before you, but because of the late hour, they, they went home and I'm representing that for you and others can speak on that behalf. Um, so with that, I'd like to start with our witnesses. I intend to call Dan Maiola of Langan Engineering, who's our civil engineer, Scott Murdoch, who's our architect, and then uh, close with Carl Penke, who's from Langan, to talk about the traffic. If we could uh, start with swearing in Dan, please. Do you solemnly swear a firm testimony about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Please state your name and spell for the record. Dan, have you previously testified in the capacity of a civil engineer before this board, board in the past? Um, not before this board, but before numerous staying and zoning uh, boards throughout the state. Uh, that occurred in 1970. I graduated with a degree in, bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Villanova University. I have a master's degree in civil engineering from Stevens Institute of Technology. I've been at Langen for, for 18 years working on applications such as this one. And have you ever testified before this board? Not before this board, no. <laughs> but you've testified before numerous boards of the state of New Jersey, is that correct? Yeah. OK, 
Okay, we'll, we'll accept you as an expert in your field, and he's just testifying for engineering, right? As civil, civil engineering, engineer? yes. Okay. And Dan, were you the preparer of the site plans, the stormwater report, and the environmental impact statement that was submitted to the board in advance of tonight's hearing? If you could start your testimony by going through and orienting the board to the site and uh, location of the property along with the existing improvements located thereon. A1, Excuse mark me. that A1. Yes, yes, I will. Um, so that, that site plan is uh, drawing number CS100 in the application package. Uh, so this has, been, this has been rendered, the aerial is in the, uh, around the perimeter of the site and the, the site plan is within the, the lot. Um, so just to orient the board, Lincoln Highway at Route 27 is along the south side of the site. Will be consolidated if approved. Uh, yes. Excuse me. Are you talking into the air? Yeah, you are. Oh. And this was off. Oh. You had it off. Oh, sorry. Apologize to everyone for that. Hopefully, you could hear what I was saying. Um, <laughs> it's not on the record. Oh, okay. Madam Chair, just hang on one second. In that 1.119 million square feet, is the office included in that? No, no, that is pure warehouse space uh, okay. with 27,000 so of additional plus office. 27,000. Okay. Correct, correct. So the gross floor area is 1.146 million. And Dan, the office that you're speaking of, that's ancillary to the warehouse space, correct? It's not independent office space, it's accessory to the warehouse that's proposed? That, that's correct. Any, any warehouse uh, uh, will have a, a, you know, some kind of ancillary office space uh, where the, the employees will, will work and do more of the clerical duties associated with the operation. Thank you. And also, for the record, the, the the zoning that governs this particular property, that's the ExxonMobil Loop Oil Redevelopment Plan? Yes, that's correct. And that's an overlay redevelopment plan the applicant uh, chose to submit under those redevelopment criteria? Yes. And the uses that are proposed, the warehouse distribution with the accessory office space, those are permitted under the um, zoning regulations. Is that accurate? Yes, they are. As far as bulk standards, uh, the bulk standards that are are provided within the redevelopment plan re related to lot width, lot area, lot depth, yard uh, setbacks, minimum yard setbacks, maximum building coverage, and minimum building coverage. Uh, the applicant is compliant with all those um, development standards, is that correct? Yes, the application is fully compliant with all the bulk standards and bulk requirements in the redevelopment plan. If you could talk about the, the parking, it's what's proposed for the facility? Sure, 464 total car parking spaces are proposed for the facility. The car parking is uh, split really in, in three different locations on the site. 
There's 122 car parking spaces to the west of the building, 224 car parking spaces to the east of the building, and then a, a satellite parking lot of 118 car parking spaces to the southeast of the building. And those parking stall dimensions, they're all in conformance with the redevelopment standards, nine by 18 feet, is that correct? Yes, with 24 foot aisle widths. And uh, there, there was a comment within the Big Nail letter talking about will, will this be a multi-tenant building. When you're going through your testimony, can you talk down how the building could be broken down for multi-tenants and how many we expect at most would likely um, be within this building? Sure, so this building as it stands today is a, a speculative building, which means there, there's no end user or tenant that's been identified yet. Um, ideally, there's, there's really only one tenant for a building for this, this building. Uh, however, we've designed the site to accommodate likely up to two tenants. And then the way we've done that is we've located the car parking on both sides of the building uh, so that you could subdivide the, the building uh, in the north-south direction and have an uh, independent user on, say, the west side and then an, a separate user on the east side. And then the office pods were located uh, with that in mind as well. And um, the number of parking stalls that are proposed on site that uh, satisfies the code with, with regard to the parking ratio that's provided in the redevelopment plan, is that correct? Yes. And if you could talk about the, the loading that's proposed and how that could be um, separated for various tenants as well. Sure, so uh, to the north of the building is 86 loading docks, and to the south of the building is 72 loading docks. Again, uh, as I stated earlier, to it, this building would likely be subdivided in the, in the north-south direction, which would allow for each user to have uh, what's, what's called cross-dock access, which means um, product could, could be delivered on one side and shipped out on the other. Uh, so, so loading dock doors on, on opposite sides of the building. And there's also a trailer parking spaces that's proposed in connection with this facility, is that accurate? Yes, there's 206 total trailer parking spaces. 109 of those are to the north, and then another 97 of those are to the south. And again, trailer parking is a permitted accessory use under the redevelopment standards, is that correct? Yes. As far as the, the parking area setbacks and the loading setbacks, uh, are, are they um, proposing a location that is in compliance with the redevelopment standards? Yes, they are. If you can briefly touch on the site circulation uh, house design, where the entrance and exit points are, and then uh, later Carl, as our traffic engineer, can go through that in a, a bit more detail. Uh, sure, and this is something that the board's planner, Mr. Bignell, had, had asked that we provide testimony for is how how trucks and, and cars would circulate the site. Um, so there, there are two driveways proposed into the site. The, the first driveway is the Vineyard Road Route 27 existing intersection. And then the second is an ingress only uh, driveway that's to the, to the west of that Vineyard Route 27 intersection. Uh, so both those driveways would head north into the site and, and T at a on-site collector road that runs in the east-west direction. Um, at that point, those are two, both three-way intersections. If, if it was a, an automobile that was ac accessing a car parking space to the, to the west, they would make a, a left on that road. If they were accessing a car parking space to the east, they would make a right on that road. Um, for trucks, it would work a little differently. If the trucks were to access this southern truck court, because trucks like to, to back in over their left shoulder, um, <coughs> access to the southern truck court, a, a truck would have to make a left on this southern collector road and enter the truck court towards the west. Whereas if they were heading to the north truck court, they would make a right on this Southern Collector Road and head to the north and around uh, the eastern side of the site. Um, guard houses are pr proposed at both entry points into the guard into the the truck courts um, if they are in fact uh, required or, or wanted by the tenant. Um, the 
Site design has been laid out to accommodate uh, queuing at each guardhouse, which is something that, uh, that Hank had, had wanted um, testified to in his, in his letter. And you'll have directional signage uh, around the site to um, advise the, the persons that enter it where they should be going as far as if it's multi-tenanted or not? Yes, uh, for both multi-tenant and, and I believe we'll also have some wayfinding signs for the cars and trucks as well. And in your professional opinion, is there an ability to safely maneuver throughout the site for truck drivers as well as emer emergency vehicles? Yes. Is there also an identification sign on site, such as a monument sign that would identify the site for um, persons that enter it? Yes, two monument signs are proposed, each of which are 250 square feet. Uh, they are proposed um, off of the, each driveway into the site, uh, right before the driveways hit the, the collector road to the south. Um, okay. both, and both signs fully comply with all the, the applicable requirements in the redevelopment plan. Can you talk about the landscaping plan briefly? Yeah, sure. Um, approximately 750 trees are proposed and close to 1,500 shrubs. Uh, the landscaping design uh, fully complies with the redevelopment plan. There's a couple ratios that must be provided in a site plan. One is uh, one tree for every 10 parking spaces. And another is one tree per every 50 feet of frontage. This landscaping plan provides that. Landscape plan also provides a, a row of, of densely packed evergreen trees um, just to the north of the southern collector road in order to, to screen um, the activity in that southern truck court from Route 27 Lincoln Highway. Uh, other than that, all the um, landscape requirements in both the, the ordinance and the redevelopment plan are complied with. Thank you. Is any fencing proposed on the site? Yes. Yes. Fencing is proposed along the, the southern collector road, uh, which will be a 10-foot high ornamental fence, as well as around the perimeter of the site, the fence towards the, the rear and western and eastern sides of the site will be 10-foot high chain link fence. And that's all in compliance with the redevelopment plan standards, is that Yes. Accurate? Can you touch on the lighting plan for the site? Sure, sure. Uh, light fixtures are proposed at, at uh, a pole mounted fixture is proposed at 40 feet high. Building mounted fixtures are proposed at 28 feet high. The lighting design was done to fully comply with the applicable requirements from the, the town ordinance. Um, with the exception of one area, or, or really two areas on the site, uh, which is around each guard house. Um, so the, the, there's a, a town requirement in the redevelopment plan to have a uniformity, lighting uniformity ratio of, of 20 to one maximum. Um, lighting uniformity is really a, a, a measurement of lighting consistency throughout the site so that there's not stark contrasts between bright, a bright spot and a, and a dark spot. So it, the way it, that's calculated is literally taking the, the brightest spot on the pavement and dividing it by the, the darkest spot, and that would be your uniformity ratio. Um, so again, that, that requirement is 20 to 1, and what, what's provided here is 26 to 1. The reason it's 26 to 1 is due to the guardhouse areas. Both guardhouse areas are the brightest parts of the site. Um, the light the lights there are mounted only at, at 28 feet instead of 40 feet high on the poles. And we hold ourselves to a, a higher illumination standards at these guard houses due to enhanced security. Um, so we, we follow really different standards in order to, to get the, the lighting where we believe it needs to be in order to, to achieve the, the whole purpose of the guard house, which is security. Uh, if you were to remove the lighting uh, calculations from these two guardhouse areas, we would meet the uniformity ratio of 20 to 1. And those guardhouses, they're pulled more inwards to the site, so there wouldn't be any sort of spillage onto the uh, exterior roadways or onto adjacent properties, is that correct? Yes. 
You also submitted a stormwater report uh, with the application. Can you just discuss briefly what's proposed as far as uh, stormwater management for this site? Sure. The, the stormwater management is designed to comply with uh, state and township requirements. There's two main watersheds on the site or main drainage areas on the site. Uh, the, the first, the majority of the site goes towards the, the rear of the property against the rail lines. And then there's another drainage area that goes towards the, the southwest corner, which is a wetland. Um, basins are proposed uh, upstream of those discharge points in order to, to detain the water as well as provide the necessary water quality that's needed in order to comply with, with the town requirements. And have you also had an opportunity to review the DR engineering review letter dated June 3rd? Yes. And can the applicant comply with all the comments as far as uh, engineering within that letter? Yes. And have you, have you also had an opportunity to review the Big Now planner's review letter dated June 5th? And as f from an engineering standpoint, if there was any comments in there, could we comply with it? Yes. Thank you. I have no further questions. Anyone else? Questions? Okay. Your next witness. Our next witness is Scott Murdoch, who is our architect. Thank you. Hello. I solemnly swear from the testimony about to give us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes. Please state and spell your name for the record. Sure, Scott Murdoch, S-C-O-T-M-U-R-D-O-C-H. Scott, what company are you affiliated with? I'm with KSS Architects. We're an architectural firm in Princeton, New Jersey, New York, and Philadelphia. Have you testified previously before the Edison Planning Board? Once, probably about 10 years ago, yes. And, and like I have testified in multiple boards throughout the state of New Jersey on projects just like this. Is your architectural license current? Yes, it is. And your license in the state of New Jersey? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We'll accept you as an expert in your field. Fantastic. Thank you. And Scott, you were the preparer of the architectural renderings and floor plan that was submitted to the board? Yes. Okay. If you can uh, discuss the exterior elevations of the um, proposed building along with the proposed building materials. Sure. So I believe this is Exhibit A2. I believe I'll mark this as a rendering of the southeast corner of our facility, looking back at the truck dock. So as you can see, it's a fairly grand entrance that works towards the type of user we hope to achieve and ultimately give them a significant corporate fill with their distribution facility. We've created these large punched openings, if you will, with high glass full of, uh, and then articulated concrete panels. These concrete panels will be heavily insulated. They'll create shadow patterns and such, again, creating a very nice textured fill that breaks down the overall size of the, and scale of the building. I'll also show you a next exhibit, which is effectively colored elevations We'll call that A3. And these represent, you can see that in these we have the two long elevations, which are the loading dock elevations. There we break down that length by introducing patterning above each of the docks. We also introduce clear story lighting to create and allow for more daylight within the facility. Uh, I'll pause there briefly. One of the things that we've tried to do is respond very as, as, as best as we can to the green building standards within the ordinance. So we do that through a series of means, one through heavily insulating the envelope, uh, making sure that it's thermally efficient. We use recycled concrete and steel wherever possible, which on a facility of this at a million square feet is a significant impact and, and a very sensible and sustainable approach. We've introduced an quite a, a significantly high windows that will bring significant daylight into the facility, enhancing the work environment of all those who are, are working within the facility. So we believe very strongly that we, and with other techniques, L energy efficient lighting and the like, we're creating a, a, a very sustainable facility 
in the spirit of your ordinance. Yeah, and just for the record, in the redevelopment plan, there were recommendations as far as sustainability um, requirements that the plan says that you should or think about incorporating. They're not mandatory, but these are the, the components uh, that have been, in fact, incorporated to the building design. Scott, as far as the redevelopment plan standards, there's a standard uh, that the maximum height of the building not exceeds 60 feet. Are we in compliance with that standard? Yes. And also, there's a requirement that the mechanical equipment um, not be visible from uh, the Route 287 view corridors. Is, 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 oh, I'm sorry, except for the Route 287 view corridors. They shall not be visible um, standing at ground level. Are we in compliance uh, yes. with that requirement? Uh, and is there any wall-mounted lighting that's proposed on the exterior of the building? There is, and as Dan testified, it's at, at approximately, I believe it was 28 feet uh, above finished floor. And are we proposing any um, facade signage in connection with this building? We are. We have six signs, all in compliance with the redevelopment uh, guidelines, 300 square feet each, uh, and they are all at, located at various corners as indicated on the drawings that we submitted. Uh, we believe that however they, the tenants will ultimately use them, that they will be in compliance again with the redevelopment guidelines. So at this point in time, we're just showing the sign boxes. Uh, the future tenant That's will right. come in either with a sign permit application or if they need a variance, they would be before the board requesting that variance. Is at that, that time, correct. Thank you. I have no further questions. Councilman? Yeah, just a quick question. Yes, <clears throat> Are you contemplating use of any solar panels to generate any power for the building, or would that be the tenant's responsibility? That would ultimately be up to the tenant, but we have take, made provisions that can accept that, so we've reinforced the steel as necessary to allow that to happen in the future should a tenant desire. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, thank you. Our last witness is Carl Penke of Langen Engineering. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Certainly. For the record, my name is Carl with a K, Penke, P as in Peter, E H N K E. Uh, by way of qualifications, I am a registered professional engineer in the state of New Jersey in good standing, as well as several other states. Uh, I have 34 years uh, uh, as a traffic engineer. I regularly appear throughout the state of New Jersey as well as before this board uh, in the recent past. We will accept you as an expert in your field as, and you're just testifying in terms of traffic? That's correct. Carl, we'll you, thank you. Carl, you were the preparer of the traffic impact study that was submitted in connection with the application last revised May 22nd, 2019, is that correct? That is correct. If you could, for the board, uh, discuss the background of, of your study and your ultimate conclusions, please. Yes, certainly. Uh, so for the record, uh, the application before you this evening in accordance with the redevelopment plan has really two phases to it from a traffic perspective. Uh, the traffic impact study uh, primarily addresses the first phase, and I'll talk to the second phase uh, in, in a moment. With regard to the preparation of the traffic impact study, it's been prepared in accordance with uh, standard uh, traffic engineering practice. Uh, it includes the fact that we went out and sampled existing traffic volumes on the roadway system. We actually did that in May of 2018. We went back out in September of 2018, and we also had prior data from other sources uh, in order to review and validate it. So we have a, a good snapshot of the existing traffic flow on the roadway uh, system. Uh, the project's uh, site is a redevelopment site. It was previously developed with a manufacturing facility of roughly 372,000 square feet, supported by uh, 440 uh, parking spaces. Uh, it was last heavily active back in the early 2000s. I think it was finally decommissioned in 2016. Uh, as discussed in the traffic impact study, the first phase of the project contemplates the redevelopment and construction of the uh, roughly 1.146 uh, million square foot warehouse facility. Uh, it'll be developed uh, that utilizing the existing access driveways that previously supported uh, the Exxon Mobil site. That includes the advantage provided by the existing traffic signal at Vineyard Road 
which provided primary access into the ExxonMobil redevelopment plant, as well as a right turn in driveway towards the southern end of the site. The site, as, been, as described by Mr. Maiola, has been laid out to marry the internal circulation to those existing driveway systems. Uh, at the traffic signal, the internal uh, circulation drive has been set back about 150 feet from the jug handle, providing uh, sufficient storage and queue uh, for the movement of vehicles both into the site and out of the site to the jug handle. Uh, as documented in the, the traffic impact study, the existing uh, traffic signal itself, functionally, with the lane arrangement and the signal operation, uh, operates at levels of service uh, B and D, depending upon the, the time of day. Uh, from an efficiency standpoint, because of the geometry of the intersection, you end up seeing some cues and delays uh, through the jug handle at, at various times. However, the existing signal, the existing signal timing, the existing uh, geometry will accommodate uh, the traffic flows that will be uh, reactivated uh, into and out of this site uh, and will uh, accommodate the, uh, the, the movements of the types of vehicles that would move into and out of the site. I would note that based on some comments of Mr. Bignell, we have uh, re revisited some of the internal geometry at the signalized location and the final plan will have a, a minor adjustment to the width of the uh, driveway connection internally uh, in the radius is just to make sure that we're, we're fully comfortable that trucks can pass each other without any conflict whatsoever moving in and out of the site uh, when it comes back, back online. Uh, with regard to the bigger picture, the redevelopment project with phase two brings the ability and, the, and, and answers the desire of the town uh, to provide a, a better improvement at the intersection of Vineyard Road uh, with this project. Uh, while it's not needed to accommodate the traffic of the site per se, uh, it has been recognized and the town's been studying with Metuchen the interchange of 287 and the intersection of Vineyard Road and trying to identify improvements that would benefit the entire region. Uh, this project through the redevelopment plan and because of the properties that we control will bring about the ability to implement a, a rather substantial uh, improvement at that intersection. It does, however, involve the cooperation of a third party property owner, which is the owner of the Luke Oil site. But what I'd like to do is convey to you and give you a, an understanding of what is being pursued and uh, proposed with regard to pretty much solving the operation of this, this, this intersection. What's before you uh, at the moment, it would be A4. A4. And it's entitled uh, Overall Concept uh, KT000, uh, uh, dated uh, today, uh, today 6 2008 It's an exhibit of a plan we've been working on with the Department of Transportation. We've met with them twice so far. We're, get, we're meeting again with them this week and also uh, working with the owner of the Luke Oil uh, site uh, in order to effectuate an improvement at this location. And to give you an understanding of what's proposed, shadowed in gray is basically the existing near side jug handle geometry and access to the site that'll come on board associated with the approval you granted tonight. Uh, and if you're familiar with the area, as you're coming southbound on Route 27, you have the 287 ramp that comes in. Route 27 southbound has two lanes. It widens slightly to sort of three lanes between 287 and the near side jug handle, and then continues south with basically two lanes along the Exxon Mobil site, along the Luke Oil site, as it continues down to, to Revlon. Uh, one of the issues with this intersection in terms of it operating at its best efficiency is the fact that it is a near side jug handle. As you come off on the jug handle, the lanes start to develop. It opens to, from one to two to three lanes as you work your way through the jug handle. It's on a curvature. It doesn't line all the vehicles up with the traffic signal so that when it goes green, you get maximum throughput and all those cars can move efficiently. So it's sort of inefficient, even though the signal really has 
the capacity and ability to handle the, the cars that goes through it. So what we've worked out uh, with the Department of Transportation uh, and Luke Oil is a concept that's going to eliminate the near side jug handle and take that movement and put it to a far side movement around the Luke Oil site. Uh, and what that involves is, uh, first of all, it requires the cooperation of Luke Oil to provide right away along their frontage so that we can widen Route 27. And it requires uh, property from Luke Oil along their eastern side so that we can straighten the approach uh, to Route 27. So what will happen in this concept is if, as you come off of Route 27 now, uh, a lane will begin, a third lane will begin with an outside shoulder. So you'll have an 11 foot lane and then a 10 foot shoulder to the outside of that. That'll continue south to the intersection of Vineyard Road uh, and then past Vineyard Road because we do have some constraints with the gas station the lane will drop to a 12-foot lane and a 3-foot shoulder. That'll continue across Luke Oil and then reopen up to a full 12-foot lane and a 10-foot shoulder all the way south to the, to the end of our property, basically creating a third auxiliary lane from 287 through Vineyard down to the end of our property and then merging back in, uh, en enhancing the, the southbound throughput at the Route 27 Vineyard Road intersection. And then the movement for left turns and U-turns to Vineyard Road will be accommodated by uh, our, our basically internal circulation system, which will be built to municipal standards uh, with an easement set for public utilization. The easement would, would accrue to the township for public utilization, signed for you in left turns, and that'll accommodate the movement of trucks, cars coming around circulating and approaching the signal. And then the approach to the signal will be fully designed with three lanes, a left turn lane, a through lane, and a through right turn lane. It'll be a proper 90 degree approach to the intersection aligned with the, la the lanes opposite it. Uh, the queuing ability will be approximately 215 feet to 225 feet of full three lanes versus the one lane to two lane to three lane configuration that, that occurs today. More importantly, what, what, what the alignment does is it allows everybody to line up directly with the signal to properly queue so when that light goes green, people are positioned to most efficiently move through the signal and continue on. So we're gonna get a, a substantial improvement in the efficiency and operation of that, that traffic signal. In addition, there'll be pedestrian improvements. Uh, there's an existing bus stop uh, that's sort of sitting out in the middle of the jug handle. Uh, there's no sidewalk to it, uh, but it is an active bus stop. Uh, we are gonna rebuild that bus stop either at its current location with sidewalks connecting it across Route 27 with crosswalks and pedestrian accommodation and the signal to connect it to the pedestrian system uh, on the uh, south side of Route 27, or DOT did actually ask us to look at possibly moving it just to the south of the Luke Oil. So that still needs to be worked out with the department in New Jersey Transit. Uh, and while not shown on this plan, uh, the department will likely require that we construct sidewalk along the entire 27 frontage. So that ultimately will be part of the plan. At the end of the day, the project, uh, once we uh, move through full DOT uh, design processes, which we're, we're moving forward with now, now that we've got some agreement with Luke Oil, as was represented earlier this evening, and with the Department of Transportation, uh, we would expect that we would be able to move this project through design in 2019 to 2020 and construct it shortly thereafter uh, and uh, effectuate, I think, what the intent of the redevelopment plan was to bring a, a really good public improvement to this intersection. So uh, this project uh, will operate uh, well designed on its initial, initial reoccupancy and reestablishment with proper geometry provided, as provided on the site plan that has been submitted and ultimately will include uh, additional improvements which will bring some relief uh, to this section of Route 27. And Carl, and just for clarification, what you were referring to as A4, that's not formally part of this application. We're showing this to the board now as a, curfew, as a courtesy as what is coming down the pike 
um, per our discussions with DOT and Luke Oil to date, as well as our multiple conversations with the township and um, the agreement that we have within our redevelopment agreement to work on these traffic improvements and come back into the board um, with an improved traffic plan, is that That's correct? That's correct, and this plan has been progressing basically on a weekly basis as we work through the involved parties. We expect to lock it down actually at our meeting on Wednesday with DOT and we'll start going to hard design. And um, in your professional opinion, do you believe that these roadway improvements in some, some form that you have discussed would, will be approved by the DOT at a point in time? At, at this point in time, based upon the conversations we've had, uh, yes, I, I believe it's approvable. Uh, we have to get through their process. It is a long and lengthy process, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, we believe we've addressed uh, some of their earlier uh, concerns with regard to access code criteria, which is why we've developed uh, the, syst the road system as designed. It, it provides something that works in accordance with their criteria. Uh, and it melded well with what would be acceptable to Luke Oil. Uh, so at this point in time, we're very confident we have a concept this evening that is going to go to hard design starting next week. And for some reason, if DOT or Luke Oil were not to ultimately come to an agreement on the traffic improvement plan, could the site still function under um, the current roadway network that is out there today? Yes, that's correct. The geometry that's been designed uh, on the site with the modifications that I uh, uh, implied a little bit earlier this evening all accommodates the, the types of vehicles that have to enter and exit the site, including the right turn in at the southern driveway uh, and the, uh, the signal operation. All of that op will, will operate well and accommodate the movements in and out of the site uh, for the period of time until this does come into line. And if it doesn't come online, it would just continue to operate. There were several, several traffic uh, questions in the Big Now letter of June 5th. If we could just go through some of them so that you can answer them for the record. Yeah, I think I hit those Madam in Chair? testimony. Oh, one moment. But Mr. Before we, we get there, I have a question. Uh, Carl, how does this affect the internal uh, traffic on the site? It doesn't. So, so the site's designed with this, this basically, for want of better terminology, a spine road that runs in an east-west direction to the front of the property. Uh, it would operate exactly as Mr. Maiola described before. Vehicles that want to get to the uh, east end of the building would make a right or make a left to the, to the jug handle or get to the west end of the building would make the left. So the only real difference uh, from a site standpoint is the section of roadway from what I would call the south entrance and exit uh, to the signalized entrance and exit will be a beefed up pavement design. It'll be more to municipal and state standards because we'll be taking public traffic uh, on that roadway. The only other difference is we'll be adding a right turn out also at the southern end. So that's another advantage of, of the design. But other than that, uh, it, is, it is basically compatible with uh, the site in, in, the, in the condition that's been designed and which we're requesting site plan approval for this evening. Carl, uh, the enhanced plan, I assume that nobody will be able to make a right turn at that first light at Vineyard. Coming off of uh, 287 or going west, or whatever, you cannot make a right turn into the property. Then. So, so if you're coming south on Route 27, you will make a right to come into the site at the signal. So that'll be a direct right. We, we set it up with a proper radius to handle a truck. Uh, there's actually a 10-foot shoulder being added to the outside. So as any standard intersection, you'd come up and make the right. And if you wanted to make a U-turn or left, you'd continue through the intersection on the auxiliary lane and come around the far side jug. Is there any, why would, I mean, a trucker not being familiar, is that they're all gonna make the right there. They're not gonna go down further to the other. That, that's fine, that we, we, could be they can come neutral. into the site here and either make the left or the right. That is serving as our entrance and it's designed to accommodate those movements. And it's intended to. So the quicker we get those trucks off and into our site, uh, the better it is. So it's designed to accommodate that movement. And, the, and there'll be signage, if you want to go the opposite way on Vineyard, that have to go to that. 
There'll be, there'll be standard DOT signage for you and left turn, you second right. So it'll all follow the MUTCD and state standards for signing the, uh, the left turn loop. Correct. If, uh, if I'm reading the study correctly, you're saying that based on, uh, with, with, with the development of that site, that location or traffic or trips are going to go down in the peak period, in the afternoon peak period, by 35 percent, we're going to have less less traffic or less trips at 35 percent, and in the morning it's going to go down by 67 percent. What we wanted to do was give you a sense of the traffic that was generated by this site in the past by the manufacturing facility, so that comparison is made to that prior traffic that was generated by the site, which had 440 parking spaces on it. Certainly, we recognize we're reintroducing something that hasn't been there for a few years, but that's the comparison that you're seeing and the result the, you're seeing. What you use as a basis, though, was that just based on you go to the book and it says previously it was a manufacturing facility of 372,000 square feet, so that's how many trips it that's generated? That's correct. It's, it's you, the, there was no, nobody, you're not using there was, the study there was, from there. Correct. There, was no, there were no actual counts of of the Exxon, but it was a large site. If you go back in history and look at the use of the parking lots, they were full back uh, in the early 2000s. There was 440 parking spaces. So we used the same, for apples to apples, we used the same standards to project for what was on the site versus what we're anticipating from the site. So it's an apples to apples by using the same standards. Well, and actually, uh, the, the projections we're making for the warehouse facility, distribution facility are actually using the higher end to be conservative. I, I actually believe it'll probably be a lot lower than what we're using in our traffic study. But when you say you're using the same, the same factor. Same database. Same database. I'm just looking at square footage and you're replacing a 370,000 square foot building with a million square feet and you're saying it's gonna go down. Correct, because manufacturing facilities, and research and manufacturing facilities have higher levels of employment, employment than warehouse distribution facilities. The other aspect of warehouse distribution facilities, which are generally beneficial, is that they, unlike a place of business, a research facility or manufacturing facility that's more tending toward nine to five normal business hours, is what we're seeing is most distribution centers have off-peaking characteristics, usually run shifts from six to three, six to four, and have their turnovers occurring uh, during periods of time that are not coincident with the peak of the roadway. So that's a, a general characteristic we've seen throughout the state of New Jersey. Hmm. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Bignell. What about an E-Trade? What if it, Amazon takes over this building? Well, they work, they work three it's shifts. really controlled by the parking that's proposed. Uh, there's 460 spaces proposed on this site, which would be equivalent to probably a facility operating with two shifts with maybe two to 300 employees. Uh, most of, and, and Amazon actually has the, e, or e-commerces have all different types of things, but like the one across the street, there's probably, I think it's someplace 12 to 1,500 parking spaces there versus the 400. So this site, as it's currently configured, would not accommodate that tenant unless we came back to the board for additional parking somehow. Uh, so the, I, would, I would expect the user of this site, given the number of parking spaces, you're usually looking at someone that wants, you know, uh, two to 300 employees, that 400 spaces would give them the cushion for that turnover period. Yes. Madam Chair, just a, just a couple quick questions. Um, so if we do get this enhanced DOT uh, configuration approved, it'll help us a lot with coming off of 287 this craziness that we got there now going on with people coming off at 27 people using the jug handle and taking their life in their hands it'll it'll be it'll be like an acceleration lane right Where yeah it, it's actually going to be it, first of all it's compatible with the longer range thinking for the interchange that Metuchen and Edison's been looking at but yeah it, it's really going to pick up 287 becomes the third lane and then we carry it 
that third lane through the signal all the way down. So, so you, you get rid of a, a little bit, you, to use your words, craziness that occurs in that weave area that's happening right. at the drug handle in 287 and the Walmart Drive. So it really is going to create some order here and, and bring this area up to uh, current design standards. Have you talked to the DO, uh, Department of Transportation, about getting access to 287 for these trucks to get them on and off of 287 uh, as, as part of this overall plan? We, 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 there's, no one can get direct access to 287. But that's a federal facility. Those are access controlled facilities. So there's no way we can take some of this truck traffic quicker off of 27. Have direct access to 287? Yeah. No. That's a federal action. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just along the same question, though, uh, what the councilman asked, you said it's going to be a big improvement. I'm looking at the the uh, LOS ratings, and they don't change. Well, for two reasons. One is the traffic study doesn't actually include this an analysis of this intersection because uh, we've been working and working it up. So there will be a change in in the level of service operation. The, the real change that's going to occur, though, it's, it's not a is what we're really finding is this intersection really should be operating better than it is today. It has capacity in it, but the issue is the oddball geometry, the curvature of the ramp. People really aren't properly lining up. So while, and I'll give you an example, while I have two lanes approaching the signal today, if you actually go out there, you'll see the first four people queue in this lane. And then the next guy will come in, he'll realize that, and if he knows the intersection, he'll go around to the right. right. And then another guy will come in, it'll get to the point where you probably get two or three vehicles in the right lane, and then this cues back and stops the next guy from getting there. So, so while I have a three-lane approach, I really only have that for about a, you know, 150 or so feet, which is why this is gonna completely clean that up because now I have somebody coming around here, he's got the straight shot, he's got two lanes, he can see the two lanes, and those two lanes are properly aligned. So, so we're going to load the signal better, and when the signal turns green, that traffic is going to move through, uh, because it gets long periods of green time, and, it, and it's going to be able to take advantage of that and just move through the intersection nice and cleanly. And that's probably the bigger advantage. And the other advantage is cleaning up this weave section in here and just carrying that traffic through the intersection in a more orderly fashion. So it's really an efficiency standpoint because, you know, quite frankly, this signal really should be operating better than what you're seeing today. Madam Chair? Yes, Mr. Peasy. Carl, how, how many uh, stacking cars do you have going around that, uh, that new U-turn? All the way around? All the way around. It's big. I wouldn't expect, first of all, by our Q analysis, I wouldn't expect any queues to be extending back to the internal roadway. Uh, and that distance itself is, is 230 feet back from the stop line. So I've got a 230 foot long left turn lane and then basically 460 feet of effective storage for the two through lanes. But, you know, coming around, I've got another, oh, I don't know. Yeah, take a lot of cars off the road. Just stacking them up. <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe another thousand feet. But based on our analysis, our queues are never going to extend back into our into the internal road. Okay. It's similar to the uh, internal jug handle that they put in on Route One off by by uh, Parsonage Road there, a couple of those circles that they put in there, because that'll, that'll take a lot of cars off of 27, right, if they're stacked up in that, in that internal it, loop. It just system. cleans up. Every once in a while, right. you'll see that period of time where it backs on the, tw all right. that goes away. Goes away. Right. All that goes away. And, and it's that's more it's efficient. Key. It's a more efficient design. Yeah, the, the 90 degree design is, is, you know, it's more efficient. It, the signal will be upgraded. Uh, it'll be a new signal. The, the, the signal heads out there are substandard. They're eight-inch they're eight heads. They'll be 12-inch heads. Uh, as I said, they'll be pedestrian accommodation uh, through the intersection. So it's basically a new signal, uh, and uh, it's night and day, the efficiency. And you could, you could even visualize it. If you try to take a look at this gray area, which is what 
is processing those vehicles today and not too badly and then see what it's doing in terms of the area we're creating. It's, it's, a, it's a, a much larger situation that we're creating. I would ask our uh, counselor, Mr. Rubin, we have a we have the an attempt by the Edison Police Department to sign off on this, and they are, it looks to me like they're throwing their hands up and said, just expect expect a lot more congestion, and it's going to get worse. How do we tie in the report, or have you talked just to our police quick. department, or is you know what? Well, we're I, getting a report from them that says they, they can't. Yeah, but I, they've never seen this plan. That's what I'm saying. Have yeah. you worked with them? Have you shown them? And what happens if we don't clear this discrepancy up before we go forward with that? If I could just give you some, some background. Um, one, the, the police department has not seen this proposed traffic plan because this is too short. Sorry. 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 It's a, it's a record breaker. Thanks. Okay. So, no, number one, the police department has not seen this uh, proposed concept plan because this will be coming in officially as phase two of our development. But, but more importantly, um, our, the applicant has been working hand in hand with the township traffic engineers who are Mazer with Langen, and they have, they have no issues with the um, proposed de development, you know, as it is today, and as far as um, what we're proposing, obviously it will be a, a benefit if, if and when this does come to fruition. Repeat again, who are they working with? And with Edison, you said? They're, they're working on behalf of the township of Edison. Yes, Mazer Consulting is, as far as traffic, and they've been, um, reviewing our development plans along the way. And I think Carl can also testify to that, that um, there has been no objections to this point in time as far as the traffic plan is concerned. Yeah, more importantly, they've been involved with us with meeting with DOT. In fact, they'll be at this week's meeting uh, in moving this forward. With regard to the police report, I just saw it this evening, a couple of comments on it. While I respect uh, the officer's opinion with regard to traffic generation, I respectfully suggest to the board we do know what we're doing in projecting traffic. I, with I, would, regard also, with I, I would also suggest that also, but the key is somebody's got to talk to the folks because we have in front of us, our bylaws say we need a sign off by the police department. And unless somebody talks to them and gets them to review and take We have pay. no issue speaking with the police department as a condition of approval if the board were inclined to grant this application. I think they need to be lined up. I think we need some supportive documentation from them. Okay, anyone else? Comments? No? Uh, Mr. Peasy? Uh, can you just address the 158 loading docks and, and the movement? As to it um, pertains to coming in and out. So, so as described by Mr. Maiola, the loading docks can be accessed to the, to the north side or generally accessed by coming up the east side of the building. Uh, and the loading docks are all designed with proper geometry to current standards in order to accommodate the movements of trucks in and out of the loading docks or to the trailer storage areas, uh, as well as on the south side, the trucks can come in and access the whole south side as well as exit. You know, both, both loading dock areas, both truck courts can be accessed from both sides of the building, uh, but the, 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 they're designed to have their access available to truckers from the directions they prefer to approach them on. And they would feed right into your new yellow. So, so shown on A1, the east-west spine road circulation road to the outside of the south uh, truck port area is the same uh, spine road that's shown on A4. So it's, it's, it's common to both plans. So the only difference with both plans is that when we actually build this, we're going to build this to a different pavement standard. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, anyone else? Okay. I don't know. You're done with your keys? If I 
Um, yes, that was the last of our witnesses. I, I just want to just clarify, we, we have no problem meeting with the police department, but as far as trip generation, all we can use at this point in time is the IT model because we don't have an, an end tenant. It's, it's speculative. But I have absolutely no problem with that, but I would, I would, would like, like to see, and we're going to have a condition if we, I would recommend a condition if we approve it that there has to be some coordination with the traffic control sure. coordinator and the police department so uh, they can reissue so they can reissue the June 12th memo or update I shouldn't re say reissue update their June 12th memo to us on this application and that's fine so yes that would conclude our affirmative case thank you so I think at this point I'll open to the public is there anyone that wants to speak as to that application? Yes, yes. Please come forward. Your name and address. Thank you. <clears throat> Esther Nimitz, 162B Fay Street. No, do you want to swear me in? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth? No, no. Wait, I'm sorry. Do you solemnly swear from you? about to give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Um, Carl Penty. Carl Penty. Okay, thank you, Mr. Penty. Uh, First of all, if we could just go back to the uh, width of the amount of space that you're going to be taking along 287 across the bottom there. Other side. Yeah, that. So in front of the Luke Oil? Yes, how, how wide is that space you're trying to get? So from Luke Oil, uh, from the existing curb line, we are going to be widening uh, approximately 12 to 13 feet. So the existing curb is going to be pushed back about 12 to 13 feet, which is going to give us the ability to create three lanes plus a three-foot shoulder. Well, if you're going to try to take 12 to 13 feet there, I think you're going to have to move a lot of telephone poles that along that whole stretch. There's quite a few telephone poles, and they're right up practically to the curb line. That is correct. So associated with the project, we would there's a whole series of pole lines uh, that we will need to relocate uh, along Route 27. That is correct, and that's part of the design. Uh, I would imagine PSC and G has to be involved in approving that and agreeing to do that, or how does that work? So, as, so how that works is as part of the design, we lay out the geometry and then we coordinate with PSC and G. Uh, PSC and G provides input as to how the facility, how they want their poles placed, uh, and then ultimately PSC and G actually relocates them. It's it's fairly standard in design and construction. All right. In terms of Luke Oil. Uh, if you're reducing the amount of space they have in front of their pumps there? So to be specific on Luke Oil, and one of the concerns of Luke Oil was they did not want us to relocate their driveways nor to change their internal circulation. So the design that's being implemented does not reduce any of the internal circulation elements of Luke Oil. Uh, it does reduce slightly the width of the driveways to bring them a little more in conformance with DOT criteria. So they're being narrowed by a couple of feet. Uh, and then we're going to curb and improve their parking facilities. But access to the pumps, circulations to and from the pumps remains as it is today. Well, does it not reduce the amount of space in front of the pumps there? No, it does not because the area that's being taken is actually... Uh, in border area, it's actually cur it's actually green space today. So there is there's a significant area that is not circulation today that we are using. I wouldn't have thought that was 12 to 13 feet, though. It is. Is it really? Yep. Uh, you'll have to replace the curb. This it'll be all new curb along the frontage. There'll probably be a little bit of reworking of the grading of the driveways. 
uh, and reworking of their uh, parking areas in accordance with, uh, with our coordination with Loop Oil. Okay, and you've got Dunkin' Donuts next door there? Or They're what? part of the Luke Oil site and a tenant in the Luke Oil site. They are not impacted uh, except by the fact that they'll benefit by the improvements uh, and the curbing and, and definition that were given to the driveway. So the Luke Oil site access, circulation, and parking are actually all being enhanced by this project. All right, now uh, on the other side, coming uh, from 287, um, if you're not going to have the turn into the site, you're going to have to allow for the trucks to make a right-hand turn in there? Correct, right. At and they're going to have to have plenty of turning radius. And they will. And, and width to get around there. Correct. Because they're going to be facing outcoming cars. Correct, so when we design this, we have to design it to current NJDOT criteria lane widths, shoulder widths, sidewalk locations, handicap ramp locations, the design of the signals, the design vehicle turning maneuvers, all a part of the design and we have to meet current standards uh, and will meet current standards in that design uh, to accommodate those movements and, and that is all part of the design plans that will be advanced forward. All right, I use that intersection a lot. Uh, one of the things that would concern me about the trucks making their turn into the face of oncoming traffic is that if I'm going to go down and come all the way around and come back out and I'm uh, there uh, watching these trucks uh, turning in, they need a huge turning radius, so huge, the in order not to be trying to put their cab in the face of the oncoming, outgoing traffic there. So, so the right turn movement of trucks into the site requires no encroachment on the outbound. In fact, the inbound and outbound movement is going to be separated by a two foot wide raised concrete median. So similar oh. to what's across the street, there'll be a little dividing raised concrete median. The, the entry width is over 23 feet in width. The radius is over 50 feet in width. All of that is designed to accommodate the, the easy movement of a tractor trailer into the site. So what you're saying is the incoming traffic will be separated totally from the outcoming traffic by a barrier. That's correct. Okay, well that's an important feature to know. That's very important to know that that's being considered to keep that separation. Uh, For the traffic that's coming in, they're going to be faced with the warehouse right away. In the new, in the in the new plant, going all no going. Let's go down the street now. Let's go down the street and go in the other entrance. When they come in there, they're going to be faced with the warehouse right away, because what you're saying is that they have to. Now you could put up the other. Could you put up the uh, or take that one down? And behind it is the other. Yeah, that one. Okay, where the roadway is there that you're uh, saying is going to be in front of the building, this road coming in now is going to run right into that road because it's going to practically run right into the building. It's going to run into our external roadway uh, with proper geometry and signage directing traffic to continue around uh, to the traffic signal. It's, it's so they're going to be running into the trucks that are using that roadway there. Well, it's a road, so they'll be running, they'll be, they'll be sharing, they'll be using the roadway, which will be designed to accommodate the types of vehicles that will be on it. So the, the, the road is wide enough, it's striped properly, it'll be signed properly uh, to accommodate those movements. There's no encroachment across lanes. Uh, it's, it's all designed to accommodate the vehicles that'll be using this road. Where's the gatehouse for that? Gatehouse is at this location, and the gatehouse is at this location. All right, but but the cars coming in, they don't they don't have anything to do with the gatehouse because the gatehouse is past that. That's past it. So it's so past for, it. for for a driver, they're, they're basically going to be, for all effective purposes, they'll be on roads. It, it's a, it's it'll be just a, as if they were on a municipal road. They, no discernible difference.
Okay, the, um, you, you gave the, the, two, the Route 27 a, a, an 11 inch lane and a 10 foot shoulder. Explain it now. Can we put up the other one? You can show me the width of the lane and the shoulder just so I understand that. So standard lanes on Route 27 today are 11 feet wide. We will be constructing a third 11 foot wide lane and then we will be building outside of that a 10 foot shoulder which is the minimum DOT shoulder width. So the shoulder is existing area for breakdown and so forth of a vehicle. So starting at the 287 ramp where you have two lanes today and no shoulder, you'll have three lanes plus a shoulder as you continue south on 27. So should your car break down, you'll have a place to move your car out of traffic. Okay. And then on the other side, uh, you're going to have a, a lane that's how wide? So on the other side, the design where we have to tighten it up in front of the Luke Oil, right. we design what's effectively known as a 15-foot bicycle compatible lane. That's accomplished by creating a 12-foot actual travel lane and then a 3-foot striped shoulder. So to get past Luke Oil so that we don't infect their internal circulation, we neck that down. That is a DOT standard, so we're still within DOT standards. Uh, until we get past Luke Oil, and then we go back to a full shoulder. Okay, 12-foot lane and a 3-foot shoulder. That's so it's correct. a smaller shoulder on that That's side. correct. Okay. Bigger shoulder on the other side, probably needed for the trucks anyway. Okay, I think I understand everything that you've explained, and I appreciate your taking the time to uh, answer my questions. You're welcome. Uh, and I hope it helps the public, too. Thank, Thank you, you for your much. comments. Thank you. Anyone else? Having seen no one else come forward, I'd like to make a motion we close public portion. Second. Okay, all well, in favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. What, did you have any other comments for closing? State of, the, uh, state of the art warehouse building, which the redevelopment plan recognizes and uh, is an ideal type of use um, for its location next to the interchange. This is a fully conforming application. No variances are requested other than a, a minimal design standard for the light levels at the guardhouse for security reasons. For, for the reasons stated tonight, as well as the testimony given, I'd ask that the board look favorably on this application. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, make a motion to grant uh, preliminary and final approval for this application, including the requested uh, waiver for the uh, lighting standards at both uh, guard houses on the issue, and also as a condition of approval that the uh, applicant work or update or keep the uh, police uh, um, traffic control coordinator updated so he can issue a revised uh, June 12th letter to the board once he's convinced and he has access to the work you've done on there, uh, changing their position on the uh, traffic situation over there. Uh, also the conditions that uh, adherence and acceptance, I believe you agree to all the recommendations made by our consultants as outlined in the uh, Mr. Bignell's and Mr. Carley's uh, memo, latest memo, and finally adding the proviso that no changes can be made to these conditions of approval uh, without returning to this board and requesting uh, our approval. Madam Chair, I'd like to second that motion. Okay, Lillian. Yes, for preliminary and final. Yes. Yes. Yes on the motion. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. 
Thank you, and we very much appreciate your time more than ever tonight on this application. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, any other comments from the public? Make a motion. We close public portion. Okay. Second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. If no one has any other comments, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Quickly. Meeting adjourned. Oh, wow. Bye.